<clears throat> I'm not very happy. Greetings, everyone. Long time no see. Sorry I haven't been that active. I've been too busy with personal shit, like looking after my health, saving up for college, and getting into fistfights with random strangers in the street. This cocksucker just stole my fucking egg roll. Grimy ass cocksucking Brooklyn squirrel, you took my fucking egg roll, you fuck. So the reviews have been a little on the download for the last few months. I haven't given up on making them. I recently just finished my script for my next review. They just take longer to make now because of how little free time I have in comparison to last year. But don't you worry, they are coming and they are coming soon ish. But before I dive back into the miserable pus-filled world of figuring out which Spider-Man movie is actually the good one, I thought I'd have a look at the old YouTubes to see how some of my peers are performing. Ecom have recently just shot up to 800 subs in the past few weeks. Super happy for them, you know, they do a great job at delivering consistent content through their Flash videos and many podcast episodes, so that is well deserved. The, um, no, not that one. What about the, um, no, that one's no good either. Uh, here, uh, here we go. Madvik has just released a new review on Spider-Man No Way This Isn't Already Mean to Death, and it's doing pretty well. Nearly 180k views in 11 days in the time of writing this, and he's picked up a nice boost of subs. Pretty damn spicy, if my opinion matters at all. So it seems at least those people are doing alright, and they do not at all appear to be in the middle of a stupid, an unnecessary feud, with a narcissistic, hypocritic, gatekeeping, puts the milk before the cereal, leech from the YouTube sphere, who exclusively goes after low-hanging fruit in an attempt to make himself more intelligent than a lemming in heat. Right? No. Meet the Birdman. Or is it TH3 Birdman? I don't care. Point is, he's a YouTuber who makes videos in the same style as CinemaSins. Being that anytime he finds something egregious about the content he is watching, he will point it out, comment on it slightly, and explain why he thinks it's of poor quality, with some jokes thrown in for good measure. He just doesn't do the ding thing CinemaSins is famous for. You, you know the one. Doctor, what is that? Kinda like who I am here. The superhero thing. What are like some of the craziest villains that you guys have fought? But instead of going after movies or games, he makes these videos on CinemaSins themselves. And at a first glance of his channel, you would almost assume that his entire brand is to be the anti-CinemaSins given how many times he's responded to the channel. But every once in a while he will make a vlog, review a film, or even make a response video to someone who talked about him. I wonder if you can guess what I'll be discussing today. A few sentences ago, I mentioned how Madvocate had made a No Way Home video, which is currently doing very well, and rightfully so, it's an amazing piece of content with editing and style so engaging that you may even feel compelled to subscribe to his channel despite thinking he makes terrible points. What I failed to mention was that during this review, Madvocate responded to a few points made by Birdman in his cinema since Sins video on No Way Home. The reason why Madvocate did this is because it served the purpose of preemptively countering potential defenses made against his points for this movie. It was a if even one person makes this point then it's likely more people will type thing and considering how popular Birdman's channel is and how many views it gets on average, I think this was a safe call to make. Madvocate saw a point, or rather several points, made in favour of this film which he thought were of poor quality and decided to incorporate them into his video as a a means of adding further engagement. That was it. That was all he wanted to do. Lightly comment on a handful of points that were quite honestly fucking terrible and just poke a few holes into the defenses of people who think he is wrong for criticizing this film's writing consistency. All in all, I think we can consider this to be a relatively harmless act, especially since Birdman was not a large aspect of this video, right? Well, not quite. It turns out that the Birdman saw this video, or rather he skimmed past the parts that weren't about him so he could view the segments of the video that addressed him directly, allegedly. While doing that, he decided to record his reaction and present it as a direct response to Madvocate. Allegedly. It is... Uh, it's it's not a very good video. Uh, before now we get into the video, um, there is an account from someone who wishes he could be here, but unfortunately he couldn't because of um uh, he, of work. But this person, the friend of our channel and a friend of Madvocate's, has watched this video and I would like to share uh, his thoughts on the video because he actually watched the entirety of this video we're about to watch. He left um, some comments uh, on it. Well, one comment on the video, uh, and I would just like to share his experience. This 
this experience he had with the video because I think it's worth having our bit of Shandy on the stream. Um, Madvikit, would you like to read the um the comment? I think your voice will fit this very nicely. Um, sure. So hopefully people joining in don't think this is a comment from me. This is a comment from yeah. This is a comment. Do Shandy. you have it on screen? Yeah, I have it on screen. I shared it on the, okay. the Discord as well. So I can't fully agree with this comment because I haven't seen the video yet. But Shandy says, Birdman, your video is fucking terrible, and I'm baffled you are this inept at defending your own points. You've backtracked your own arguments twice and acted like Madvocate was the idiot because you needed to redraft your scripts. Trash ass video is an ironic description to use here considering the sheer lack of effort you put into making this. Not just from an argument standpoint, but also a production one. I'd ask you to do better, but considering your entire channel's identity is to be the anti cinemasins I fucking doubt you possess the ability to improve. I get defending yourself and countering points you think are unfair, but the fact you exceeded my expectations on what I can consider stupid points while radiating smug like you put a stick of plutonium in your shorts <laughs> easily makes this one of the worst videos I've ever seen. You are an embarrassing waste of protons and I hope you drink orange juice after forgetting to brush your teeth. <laughs> I forget you brushed your teeth. Um, and then I just, there's one more thing that Shandy said that I think is funny, but um, yeah, I just wanted to, um, to get this account from Shandy because, you know, he would be here if he could and uh, to honor his memory. That is a... Uh... Before we start the video, should we read his pinned comments? Oh, yeah. Or Birdman's um, pinned comments? Because yeah, we'll, it's fucking trash. We'll get to that. I just want you to read this <laughs> so that Shandy bad. told me as he was watching the video. Sky, I'm getting unbearably angry. This is worse than anything I've seen Cosmo make. And uh, Shandy has made a response video to Cosmo, not just so you're aware. And then he says, the dude is fucking splitting apart atoms at a molecular level with the amount of idiotic radiation emitting from his body. So that's the level I expect the video to be at. So expectations aren't very high, but... But, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe it'll surprise us and Madvocate will be wrong all along. Um, probably, yeah. Yeah, probably. Now, Ecom has already covered this response with Madvocate, so he could clarify his own stance on the situation, as well as his reasoning for why he did certain actions. The point of this video is to basically refine what was said there into a more compact structure, as well as responding to his second video going over Doctor Strange's inconsistent writing. Because I didn't hate myself enough today. I will also be pointing out certain behaviors that I find to be interesting to say the least. All of the videos I will be discussing today will be linked in the description if you wish to view them yourselves, especially since I know that certain people take offense if it isn't. If you would like to form your own opinion before or instead of watching my video, then please feel free to do so. Nothing is stopping you from turning this off. And if you pretend like you are still compelled to continue watching this video despite the thinly veiled trigger warning, then you only have yourself to blame. If you decided to stay, then please grab a drink, sit back, and relax, because you might pass out from sheer frustration watching this. up today and I got a few notifications about someone responding to something I said in my Spider-Man No Way Home video. You know, something similar happened to me when your video came out. I woke up on a Monday morning getting ready to go to work and a friend made me aware of this video's existence through Discord. I thought it was interesting as a concept that you chose to directly respond to what he said, so I decided to check it out on the way to work. And uh, let me tell you, that might have been the angriest bus ride I've ever had. Now, this person's video is not really about me, but they bring me up multiple times. Three times. He brought you up three times, and he didn't even really mention you as an individual, but rather the things you say in your response to Cinema Sins. Now, this is a pretty minor distinction, but it is one I feel needs to be made, simply because I want to point out something I find to be outlandishly funny. And uh, I think it would be cool to... Uh react to that and uh see what they have to say and then 
give you my response to that. Well, that's fair enough. I think you as a creator should be allowed to defend yourself or respond to comments you think are unfair. So, hey, you know what? Good for you. Just a bit of a disclaimer here. This person comes across as a um, person who dislikes the MCU in its current state, or maybe just dislikes this movie. Uh, I don't know shit about this person. All I know is they said some shit about me. And uh, you know how we feel about that around here. Yeah, I understand your perspective. Madvocate does appear to be a bit cynical with his judgment of one other MCU movie besides No Way Home, as well as one episode of a TV show in a phase of Marvel, which at this point has had four films and five TV shows. But hey, I guess you at best made an educated guess. Points for effort. And yeah, I would have no way of knowing if he liked this movie or not. I wonder how far I would need to get into his review before he gave me even an inclination of affinity towards this motion picture. So some folks want me to roast the ever-loving shiz out of Spider-Man Way Home Machine Broke? No! Understandable. But there's just one problem. I liked the movie. I really did. Oh, it took him 10 seconds to make it clear he liked this film. You couldn't even be bothered to watch the first 10 seconds of the video. Are you telling me you had such little time in your day that you were too busy to watch the first minute of something you were discussing, let alone the first 10 seconds? Yeah. I'm also happy to know that you have a habit of responding to content which concerns you. Means there's a likelihood you might even see this video and respond to it. So I think now's a good time to mention this. I will not be discussing you any further past this point with the exception of engaging with my audience in the comment section below. If you feel the need to wave your dick around at a channel with less than 400 subs, just because they said you were a bit of a twat, then good for you. I hope you have a nice day getting through all of it and that your maximum strength quarters in 10 anti-itch ointment doesn't run out too quickly. This is actually really good cream if you get a really ass hurt. You can, it says Bjor on it, uh, meaning uh, you can shove this cream up your ass. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at what they have to say. Now, I'm obviously gonna skip to the parts that uh, I have a problem with. Um, I don't wanna, you know, this guy's video is an hour and me responding to it will probably be double that time. So let's just go ahead and get to the part that I have a problem with. So unless you were given timestamps for where your segments were in this video, then that would mean you would have needed to watch at least some of this video in order to know where you were located, which makes the fact you didn't see the first 10 seconds even more questionable. But for the sake of being good faith, I will just assume you had been given the timestamps, allegedly. I also do not take much of an issue with you only covering the elements of the video that you have personal grievance with. I have done something similar in the past and I can understand the issue of time management, especially if you are only responding to something in real time instead of, you know, putting some effort into it. Doctor Strange is the worst part about this movie, with pretty much every passing second of his screen time being an insult to consistency and intelligence. Not just his character, but the magic that comes with him. What do you mean magic and consistencies? There are no rules when it comes to magic. It's fucking magic. Please block me if this is a hill you will die on. Yeah, I saw you chuckle fucks on my WandaVision video. You just know for a fact that people who say this have their own limits on how magic should operate despite declaring it's allowed to be as inconsistent as the writers want it to be. That is a very excellent point, Medvacate. I'm pretty sure if Strange was shown throwing around suns or eating universes like they were a ball of skittles, people would have a problem if he was somehow defeated by a hormone or teenager with web shooters and math. Because for some reason, contending with a being who had the power to punch away dimensions as well as casually throwing around god-level characters with next to no difficulty wasn't enough of a feat to suggest Spider-Man stood no practical chance at defeating Strange. So I wonder what Birdman will make of this. I'm uh, the most famous person in the world, I know. Oh, so word made it to the Sanctum Sanctorum. That's- Wait, was- was that it? You didn't justify why magic should have hardline rules, nor how you would implement them in any reasonable way. Of course you said this. Ignoring the fact that there's an entire origin film which establishes rules regarding sorcery and how it's supposed to be used, it isn't actually Madvocate's job to give you a guideline on how these rules are to be implemented. That's the movie's job. Pointing out inconsistencies in a film's established rules and writing isn't advocating for hardline rules either. Soft magic systems exist and are found in a lot of other popular pieces of media, which are 
then capable of being explored and expanded to varying degrees of success. Madvika can have suggestions on how he thinks magic should be implemented, but it doesn't take a genius to point out when there's a problem with how your magic works. His comments here are addressing points made against him in his WandaVision video because he pointed out inconsistencies and idiotic uses of magic in that show, and was met with a barrage of people using this defense. It should also be self-evident that Madvika is asking this film's version of Strange to be consistent with what we have already seen in his previous appearances, but I guess subtext is dead. Magic is not real, therefore it could never adhere to rules in the first place. What the fuck is this defense? Classification is the means of arranging items, objects, or people in particular groups. According to Britannica.com, it is an establishment of hierarchical systems of categories on the basis of presumed natural relationships among organisms. With magic, classification is commonly used when discussing different schools of magic. Many popular pieces of fiction implement these schools into their narratives and worlds as a means of allowing the inhabitants of their world access to multiple abilities. In popular RPGs such as the Elder Scrolls series, Series, specifically Skyrim in this instance, players are allowed access to five different schools of magic. Destruction, Restoration, Conjuration, Alteration, and Illusion. If a player reads a book containing a destruction spell, they are then able to access the spell from the Destruction tab. Not the Restoration tab, not the Powers tab, the Destruction tab. Destruction spells grant the user access to magical prowess over one of three elements, Fire, Lightning, and Frost. Thanks to dual wielding, players can use two of these spell types at once. However, you cannot cast a lightning spell when you have an ice spell equipped in both hands. This is what we call a rule. It's a simple rule but quite effective at providing information to your player stating that you need to meet a series of parameters before you can cast a certain spell. At the bare minimum, you need to read a book containing the spell you want, access the spell in the correct school of magic, and equip it onto your hand. You also need a high enough FP bar before you can cast that spell, giving players is limited access to only the most rudimentary magic in each school. Now, if you as a player were to access console commands and give yourself unlimited FP, then you could use basically any spell that you wanted. However, this is what we call breaking the game, or rather, not playing as intended. When this happens in a video game, most people can recognize that you have not followed the in-game rules of how to acquire this magic. If you somehow manage to cast a fire spell while having a frost spell equipped in both hands, then you have broken the internal consistency of the game. Again, something most people would be able to recognize as not an intended feature. So why exactly is it so hard to do the same thing with these fucking movies? Here is one simple rule from Doctor Strange. You need a sling ring to open a portal. If you don't have one then you must either possess the innate ability to teleport or you have access to an object of power which allows you to cross space and time. If you were somehow able to open up one of these portals without a sling ring, then do you know what you are doing to the established rules? You are breaking them. This is a foundational rule that, for the meantime, has remained consistent throughout the entire MCU. However, another rule that was explicitly stated as a requirement to use the spell was that you needed to paint a picture of where you wanted to go in your mind before you could access that location. This was, again, another foundational rule on how to use the sling ring. But, unfortunately, this foundational rule was broken, and you don't think that's a problem. Magic is fictional, sure. However, what isn't is the idea that writers and creators possess the ability, nay, the imagination necessary to create these fictional worlds without breaking them. D&D is another popular series where dungeon masters craft campaigns for their players as they trek across whatever setting they have been placed in. The dungeon master is responsible for maintaining the structure of the story in order to make sure the players don't break the campaign. One of the foundational elements of the structure is to make sure players cannot abuse magic. Dungeons and Dragons comes packed with a series of guides and rule books on how to successfully implement magic as well as how to classify spells correctly. Now, obviously, how magic is used in this game is explicitly down to the rules given by the dungeon master. However, this does not then mean the consistent rules are impossible. You ninny. Any rules you place on magic is due to the writers, which contradicts your argument against writers using magic how they see fit. I mean, like, do you not hear yourself? Writers implementing rules is writers using magic how they see fit. Take JK Rowling's Harry Potter universe for just a quick second. At first, the rule was Accio, the summoning charm, doesn't work on living creatures. This rule was later broken a few times. 
But the point is, there was a rule. Ooh, what's going on there, bird boy? You look a little bit annoyed, a smidge ruffled that the rule was broken in favor of progressing the story. Now, I haven't seen Harry Potter in years and don't really feel like binge watching the entire series again to see if what you said is true, even though I am exactly petty enough to do that. So I will just concede that this does happen in the films. But pointing out a problem in another franchise and using that as an excuse for this franchise, being able to make as many mistakes as they want is um an interesting choice to say the least why was there a rule it served a narrative purpose for example if it did work on living creatures voldemort could just summon harry and kill him right then and there but it makes no sense for it not to work on living creatures because it's magic oh ooh, ooh, you were this close to realizing the problem with breaking continuity by allowing the spell to summon forth living creatures you then create holes in your film for later aspects of the series which is a problem birdman you are highlighting an issue you klutz and before you say some stupid bullshit about the serving a narrative purpose allow me to bring your attention to something jk rowling herself is aware of her mistakes and acknowledges them all the time since fans of her books would outline them to her in letters and interviews. According to WhatCulture.com's video on the top 10 plot holes of the Harry Potter series, JK Rowling admitted to making a mistake with regards to a chronological order of events. Recognizing something as a mistake means that you do not think it was an intentional outcome, and most writers who aren't as stubborn as YouTube film essayists would then go ahead and redraft their works in order to account for these mistakes. However, since writers are people just like you and me, they tend to miss these things, and sometimes so do the editors. That doesn't then mean they are forced to accept there was no other way. Stop it. Because it's magic. Why is there a limitation on magic? What physics is causing it to not work on living creatures? Besides the narrative reason of it would mean either the good guys or the bad guys will always win, you have to understand that limitations are often put on spells to give them a realistic or at least semi-realistic element to make them more believable. Inanimate objects have no will of their own. They cannot give consent, they cannot scream or shout or let it all out, and they cannot move away from you when you pick them up. This means that realistically speaking, you should be able to pick up a spoon without any issue. Translate that to magic and you have the same principle, only this time it's more convenient. People, or even animals, are built different. Animals will kick you, scratch you, or even kill you if you interact with them in a manner they do not like. Human beings are capable of denying consent to actions they do not wish to partake in and actively fight you if you try to force them to do something against their will. Translate this to magic and you could very likely end up having a similar situation, where the person can just decide they don't want to be picked up because fuck you, put me down. I don't know if this is is an actual explanation, but it's one I came up with in like four seconds. Give an experienced writer some time and they could likely give you a better reason. Just because Rowling may or may not have a reason for why the spells work the way that they do, doesn't then mean she can't give one. You yourself said that writers implementing rules is writers using magic as they see fit. So why would you have a problem with J.K. Rowling implementing this rule, Birdman? Unless, of course, you did have a problem with her breaking her own rules before and just decided that in order to make sure Strange doesn't look like a complete dumbass, you would just go ahead with this line of thinking. But that's just a theory. There is no explanation for that, and the answer is simply because. Magic is literally the supernatural, meaning it is beyond nature. Things that are outside of or beyond nature do not adhere to physical laws, therefore there is no way to quantify them or explain them. Sure, they don't adhere to natural law, but does that mean they don't adhere to supernatural law? Are you seriously advocating for the idea that no writer for any piece of fiction is capable of creating a cohesive and understandable rule set for the magic they implement? Am I misunderstanding your point and you just need to redraft your fucking scripts? The force isn't a real thing, yet we as an audience can suspend our disbelief and imagine that it is real in this series of moving images. When Obi-Wan tells us that the force is what gives a Jedi their power, 
Prowlers before wavering the minds of Stormtroopers, we understand that he was able to do that because of his attunement to the Force. Without explicitly saying so, the film has established that in order to achieve a similar feat, one has to be attuned with the Force and that such attunement will require an element of training, since Obi-Wan is an experienced and wizened pupil of the Force. So when we see a trained and wizened Luke Skywalker performing a similar showing of his powers in Return of the Jedi, we as an audience understand that this means he has reached a prowess similar to Obi-Wan in the first film, indicating his growth. I can't literally change your mind with the wave of my hand, but I can believe Luke does have that power because I am watching a film. It means that no matter what laws or lack thereof exist in magic, within fiction, we, the audience, could nitpick them to death because they don't make sense in the real world and they never will. What I'm saying is, trying to find logic in magic is one of the stupidest things you can waste your time with. Kind of like me, but this video. Oh, the irony. I can almost taste it, like biting into a rotten peach. Doctor Strange gets into this spell before even consulting Peter how it will work or asking any questions. He doesn't even ask, are you sure you want the people closest to you to forget you? Sorcery should have more considerations and barriers. Holy shit, CinemaSins actually making a very valid criticism. And here's where I will disagree with you, and by extension everyone that's been trying to make this point on the internet. What you and people like you have been doing with this scene and the plot as a whole is applying an out-of-universe criticism to an in-universe character. There is no doubt that Strange and Peter are making a mistake here, but those mistakes are on purpose. They are a part of the plot and characterization of these characters. Strange has literally been characterized as a person who constantly makes mistakes with magic. His first film had him playing around with the time gem, and as a result, Mordo became a villain. In Infinity War, he chose not to destroy the gem or avoid conflict, which led to Thanos winning. This is who he is. He consistently makes questionable decisions and pays for it later. What? What? What the hell is happening? These are your examples? Yeah, I guess it's easier to convince people when you simplify the ending of Doctor Strange to him playing around with the time gem. Well, well, that's a weird thing to point out, my usage of the word playing. Play, noun. Definition of play, entry one of two. Sword play, archaic. Game, sport. A particular act or maneuver in a game, such as the action during an attempt to advance the ball in football, the action in which a player is put out in baseball. Obsolete. Sexual intercourse. Amorous flirtation. Dalliance. Recreational activity. Absence of serious or harmful intent. An act, way, or manner of proceeding. Emphasis on publicity, especially in the news media. A move or series of moves calculated to arouse friendly feelings, usually used with make. The stage representation of an action or story. A dramatic composition. Drama. I mean, I would call this playing... But I digress. If you yourself refer to Strange testing the abilities of the Time Stone for the first time as playing, then why did you use that word to describe the moment at the end of the film when he faces Dormammu, if you yourself don't consider these things to be the same? Um, redraft your script? Strange rewinds time and puts himself in a time loop because there is literally no other choice. The dark dimension is eating the planet. He's on a time limit. This isn't a mistake or questionable decision. It's the only decision there is if he doesn't want the world to perish. The point isn't that it wasn't his best option. The point is that his action had a consequence. Meanwhile, they are a part of the plot and characterization of these characters. Strange has literally been characterized as a person who constantly makes mistakes with magic. Who constantly makes mistakes with magic. You're mad. Thank goodness for that, because if I wasn't, this would probably never work. No, Birdman, I think you misunderstood the point you made in your own video. Based on what you are saying here, you are implying that Stranger's choice to use the Time Stone to defeat Dormammu was a mistake, because it led to Mordo becoming a villain, when, as Madvika points out, it was his only option. Your phrasing of this point directly contradicts your clarification of saying that Stranger's choice only led to him facing a consequence, unless you truly believe he made a mistake in this scene. 
And if that is the case, then I would need you to explain to me what you think he could have done alternatively in this moment. To imply that Strange made a miscalculation in his decision to save the planet is a mighty bold claim, and a terrifyingly stupid hill to die on. But I could just be misunderstanding your points again, and to that I say... Ugh, redraft your script. Mortal's philosophy is that these things should have a natural flow of events, and that disturbing this flow will have consequences. The consequence we know of being that Strange created another villain. I'm talking about saving the Earth, and I'm talking about what happens after the Earth was saved, which we still don't know the full extent of due to our mortal not making another appearance yet. If you wanna criticize the MCU, criticize them for not following up on this plot thread. I can do both. Yeah, anyway. What was I supposed to do? Just let him die? Maybe. Can't watch anymore. And Birdman's not talking about this scene, guys, but how about we take a look at it anyway? Tampering with continuum probabilities is forbidden. I, I, I was just doing... But that, that's literally what I was talking about when I was talking about playing. His first film had him playing around with the time gem, and as a result, Mordo became a villain. Mordo became a villain. Birdman, I don't know if anyone told you this, but these are two different scenes that take place roughly 50 minutes apart. This is not at all what you were talking about in your response to CinemaSins. And if it was, then you needed to make that clear, because Mordo does not become a villain solely because of this scene. F -f redraft your script, man. But, okay. Exactly what it said in the book. What did the book say? About the dangers of performing that ritual. Yeah, I don't know, I haven't gotten to that part yet. Temporal manipulations can create branches in time. Unstable dimensional openings. Spatial paradoxes. Time loops! He's showing what I'm saying. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Mordo being upset with Strange fucking around, if you don't like the word playing, with time. Okay? That then means... Mordo is going to be a problem later. We saw that at the end of this film, in the end credit scene. That's what I'm talking about. Then you did an incredibly poor job of presenting this point in a clear manner. Your initial video to CinemaSense makes two mentions to Mordo's turn at the end of the film. Not the scene where Strange fucks around with an apple, but arguably the best part about revisiting this film to fact check your smug, condescending, and insufferably inconsistent prostate exam you call a video was discovering this line from Mordo. We did it. Yes, yes we did it by also violating the natural law. Magic is literally the supernatural, meaning it is beyond nature. By also violating the natural law. Things that are outside of or beyond nature do not adhere to physical laws. Therefore, there is no way to quantify them or explain them. The natural law. This means that no matter what laws or lack thereof exist in magic within fiction, we, the audience, could nitpick them to death because they don't make sense in the real world and they never will. The natural law. Put that in your crack pipe and schmunk it, you visibly crustacean cephalopod. But let's keep going. You want to get stuck reliving the same moment over and over forever or never having existed at all? I really should put the warnings before this, though. Oh. He realized that despite following the book's instructions down to a T, he should have read the warnings first. And that was only because they were listed after the spell, not because he made a mistake, like ignoring it on purpose. So he learned his lesson about reviewing warnings prior to casting spells, and even pokes fun at Kaecilius dying from not doing this. But you're literally making a video about Strange doing this exact thing in Spider-Man No Way Home. You were this close again! Birdman, you fucking moron! That's that's the problem! Strange is being a clueless asshole which is inconsistent with how the first film ends. In Doctor Strange 1, he puts the time stone away until he learns how to properly use its power. He begins reading warnings on spells before casting them. He takes the Ancient One's advice on not focusing his attention solely on himself, but also the safety and well-being of others because his arrogance and desire to never fail is what prevented him from reaching greatness. All of this character development and growth has just been squandered by only a handful of actions and you think that is okay because you are actively ignoring the elements of his character which contradict your understanding of who Strange is. You are a bumbling buffoon and you need to revise your arguments. This 
mindset in America, in the Western world, is a sickness. It is deviant, and we do not want it. Eh? Apparently, he didn't learn his lesson. You're trying to make the case that he learned his lesson in his own film. That's not true, but we'll continue though. We'll, we'll get to that. Yet doesn't review the warnings with Peter. As for Infinity War, not destroying the gem wasn't a questionable decision. It's his duty as a sorcerer to protect their most valuable weapon at all costs. And if you want to parade this scene around as an example of Strange making a questionable decision that led to Thanos winning, then sure, we all thought that in 2018. But now in hindsight, we know that surrender the stone in exchange for Tony's life was again the only choice Strange had if he wanted a chance at undoing the blip and killing Thanos. Madvocate again highlights the nature of Strange's commitment to being a sorcerer and explains why he would choose to secure the stone instead of destroying it. Not that there is any evidence he can destroy the stones since by this point in the series the only confirmed methods of destroying the stones are by using the stones themselves through the usage of a snap or conduits of the stone stone's own power. And while I could sit here analyzing Infinity War to an obscene degree, picking apart all of its many problems, Madvocate is still correct in saying that from a narrative perspective, Strange had only one viable option, which was surrendering the stone. Wrong, wrong, wrong. All of this is- hold up. I'm gonna make the screen bigger for you. Hold on. Oh, this- this can only be good. You literally show a scene of Tony Stark telling Strange to destroy the gym before they get into a fight with Ebony Ma. And in that scene, both Wong and Strange tell Tony that it is their sacred duty as sorcerers to protect the Time Stone at all costs, something Madvocate acknowledges when he says, It's his duty as a sorcerer to protect their most valuable weapon at all costs. The film is giving a narrative reason for why Strange will not destroy the stone. As for why he would engage Ebony Moore, I'm sorry, but did you think he was just going to put innocent people's lives at risk just so he can go and play hide and seek with a green marble? There are multiple actions and spells Strange could have implemented in this fight, such as his Shadow Clone Jutsu trick or simply trapping more in the mirror dimension. However, in this fight, Strange gets taken out of commission relatively quickly, with more restricting his movements and knocking him unconscious, which prevents Strange from using his more versatile spells. Deciding to stay and fight might have been a questionable decision, in hindsight, which is a bias that we do not allow here. It is entirely within Strange's character to assist people in battle if he possesses the means to do so. And considering he attempted to use the time stone after being overpowered by Morse telekinesis, you cannot argue that Strange was being arrogant in the scene because he is being 100% serious the entire time. That is what I am talking about. In Infinity War, he chose not to destroy the gym or avoid conflict or avoid conflict or avoid conflict. Birdman, you are advocating for Strange being character assassinated by suggesting he shouldn't assist the Avengers in battle. What the fuck are you inhaling because it is not oxygen? Had he destroyed the gym there, instead of trying to fight, Thanos would not have won. A sorcerer's sacred duty. Four simple words you seem to continue to ignore for no explicable reason despite proclaiming to have seen this film. And again, you are assuming Strange can actually destroy the stone when this is what was required of Wanda to kill Vision. Stop asking for shit you cannot prove is possible. The part of Infinity War where they're at the point of no return. Strange looks into the future at that point in time. He specifically states he looks into the future, meaning the future from where they are on Titan. Oh my God! Wow! If Strange knew he could look into the future, why didn't he try that when Bruce warned him at the Sanctum Santorum? That is an excellent question, Birdman. Now you are thinking like someone who can actually muster a thought. Strange has just been made aware of the danger he now faces, and thus he should be looking for viable ways to make sure that the outcome of Thanos winning is as far removed as possible. The only issue is that he is working with limited time and needs to devise a plan in order to locate the remaining stones, as well as gaining the assistance of Tony Stark, who, no matter the outcome, would be a tremendous ally in defending the planet. And, as the scene on Titan explains, looking forwards in time takes a great deal of concentration, energy, and time, all of which are resources he chooses to use in the moment to secure the present situation. It isn't until he reaches the point of no return that he decides to look into the future because, as Madvika pointed out, he had no other choice available to him at the time. Well, unless you count the slingering portals which can teleport him back to Earth, 
Thank you, Endgame, for completely removing any and all tension you may have created in this film by incorporating a lack of limitations. But whatever, magic isn't supposed to have rules anyways, right? He tried to fight instead of looking at possible outcomes at that point in time. Had he done that, he might have seen that the stone could be atomized and that would prevent Thanos from acquiring all of them in the first place. You are arguing from hindsight bias again. It makes sense for Strange to protect people as the Sorcerer Supreme. Stop trying to make Infinity War look worse just so you can wave away Strange's stupid decision making in this film. It's pathetic. The silly argument you're trying to make is that he wouldn't destroy the gym because of his sense of duty but you're forgetting that he looked into the future on Titan and saw that the gym could be destroyed. So had he looked into the future before the fight with Ma, he would have realized the gym could be de destroyed anyway. Yes, you saw Tate's silicon flashlight. He saw the stone could be destroyed by using the other infinity stones, something he has no access to at this current moment in time. You are also actively ignoring the part of the video which states Strange would not destroy the stone even if he had the ability to do so. Please unplug your ears and listen to what he is saying instead of running away with a completely wrong interpretation of his argument. And instead of fighting, he would have looked to destroy the gym because he would have saw that possible future he'd have gone oh that gym's going to be destroyed anyway and it's not going to be that big a deal why didn't he look into the future before jumping into a fight with ebony maw that's what i'm talking about i'm so glad you think madvocate has the ability to smell arguments you meant to make instead of just going with what he heard you say in the video he is responding to it's not like you didn't make your position clear at all or anything and you are choosing to retroactively alter your own points in order to make them seem more thought out just so you can one-up madvocate when in reality anyone who watches this video will not be able to come to that conclusion because you don't make it clear what you are talking about the fact you felt like you had to clarify your own position in a response video just further proves my point that you need to oh my fucking god redraft your script but no he decided i can fight i'm gonna go out there and fight and that seems like questionable decision making to me then you are a fool birdman as bullshit as the one in 14 million thing is it's something infinity war and endgame established there was no other way did you fucking forget that Thanos needed to win so he could lose later? Maybe. So no, your two examples do not prove he consistently makes mistakes or questionable decisions. Oh, but it wasn't two examples, was it? Was it not? Yes, because I because I don't give a fuck about what if or what if. Oh, he mentioned what His if. Oh yeah, examples. I remember when we talked about that. Yeah, yeah, I sent it. I sent it to you, but since I haven't, I have no interest in what if, and I. I know it is it canon it's probably canon but like i don't give it a fuck canon, about yeah. what if it's canon but it's yeah, a different it's universe canon. so it doesn't matter meanwhile back in the lowlands there were three examples and it's a wonder why you cut me off there i'm not gonna say you're being dishonest well i'm going to call you a cunt you're a cunt but uh Let's take a look. His first film had him playing around with the time gem, and as a result, Mordo became a villain. In Infinity War, he chose not to destroy the gem or avoid conflict, which led to Thanos winning. In What If, Strange becomes an amalgam of all the dark magic he consumes in the pursuit of saving his love interest. Of course, this supports the position that Doctor Strange often acts without thinking things through to their logical conclusion, which was my point. Considering that your first two examples did have Strange performing his duties and executing actions that required a great deal of thought before being executed, I'm curious why exactly you think Strange from What If supports your argument here. Yes, What If is canon to the MCU, I am not disproving that. They take place in the same multiverse with the premise being that each episode follows characters we know but with minor altercations in their lives. And by minor, I mean Hank Pym becomes a serial killer and Thanos stops being one because T'Challa presented a good argument against genocide. Now if you need me to spell out why this is a fucking problem for your point, then I suggest you start mouthing along with what I'm saying and then repeat it in the mirror before you go to bed. These characters are fundamentally not the same as the main timeline. The premise relies on them performing one or more actions that are different to their mainline counterparts, which then drastically changes their personality going forwards. Because of course it would. This isn't true for every character, just the vast majority. And the character in question here would be Doctor Strange who decided to re 
right at an absolute point in time in order to save Christine from dying. The episode follows him steadily beginning to lose his mind as he spends centuries trying to gain the power needed to change this point in time. Fucking centuries. In case you aren't aware, the only time Strange was even alive for centuries in the main timeline was during his encounter with Dormammu when he repeatedly reversed time using the Time Stone until Dormammu agreed to cease attacking the Earth. And even that was just him replaying the same moments over and over again, not physically moving along with the natural passage of time. This episode has the Ancient One splitting the timeline to allow for two possible futures, one where Strange continues to search for power to save Christine and one where he lets go of the past and focuses on becoming the Sorcerer Supreme. What this means for the character is we get to see how each of them behave when put into different situations, with the final result being that they heavily disagree with each other. The good Strange in this relationship sees that evil Strange is trying to destroy the world, but instead of going along with it for the sake of saving Christine, he fights his alter ego and attempts to save the world. To say that each Strange is the same person would be true on a surface level, but their personality and outlook on the world is entirely different. And, most importantly for this argument, the good Strange would never risk the fabric of reality to save his heart. Your third example has an interpretation of Strange which more closely resembles our mainline Strange compared to the example you provided. And you still think you have a good point? One which, again, relies on you ignoring a fundamental aspect of the media you are using as a reference. I wonder if we will continue to see this going forwards. Of course, you're going to say this doesn't count because it's what if, but I would counter with it does count because what if is literally putting the MCU characters with all of their personality traits intact in various situations to see how they would cope. Eh, I think Evil Strange is molding more than coping, honestly. The head writer of What If explicitly states What If is canon to the MCU, so I don't want to hear it. Okay, you won't hear it. You're still wrong, though, even if we used your example, because that's not how consistent behavior works, you anthropomorphic ice cube. You cut off that part of my video because it's one of the most damning pieces of evidence that supports my position. Uh. Oh, but it wasn't two examples, was it? Was it not? Yes, because I because I don't give a fuck about what if or what if. End of flashback. But we can't have that when you're building false narratives about movies you dislike, can we? My Habibi in Allah, you couldn't even watch the first 10 seconds of his video. Please shut the fuck up about him creating false narratives when you couldn't even do the bare minimum research, you sentient loincloth. Also, I'm confused now. When you say there is no doubt Strange and Peter are making a mistake, it kind of makes it seem like CinemaSins' criticism is that Strange performing a spell at all to help Peter is the mistake. But it's not. It's that he doesn't fucking say anything that would prompt Peter to set certain parameters before and just jumps into it despite not being in a hurry. Yeah, I bet you are confused. Yes, please take this tone when you have actively contradicted your own arguments in order to dunk Madvocate. I needed more of a reason to dislike you. Forget the dick sucking you're doing for CinemaSins right now. Meanwhile. And just to be crystal clear, CinemaSins No Way Home video is dog shit, as expected. But this is one of like two valid criticisms he made that Birdman should have just skipped over. The bare minimum research. Couldn't even do that. My explanation is that both these characters are fucking up here. Strange's mistake is jumping into a spell without consideration for precisely what the other character wants. And Peter's mistake is asking Strange for the spell in the first place. Right, so Peter Parker, a 17 year old kid who just had his entire world shattered before his very eyes and has spent the last few months hounded by the public and falsely accused for a crime he didn't commit, asked a wizard if he could make everyone forget who he was so he could go back to his regular life. The wizard says that not only can he do that, but it would have zero negative consequences if he does it correctly. And you think Peter is making a mistake for taking the wizard at his word. Is Peter to blame for fucking up the spell? Yes, but only by technicality because he couldn't stop asking Strange to give precise parameters since he was panicking that the people he cares for would forget him. Strange, the former master of the mystic arts, should not be this boneheaded despite being an arrogant arsehole. He was one of, if not the greatest surgeon on the planet. Do you think he would have gotten this title if he didn't do his job correctly? And what about the fact that for a brief time he was the Sorcerer Supreme despite only being at the Sanctum for a few years? Do you 
you honestly expect me to simultaneously believe that this character is incredibly pragmatic and intelligent despite regularly fucking up due to his character flaw? What a load of bullshit. This spell never happens without Peter going to Strange to ask him to reverse time, so these events are tied to each other and therefore both need to be addressed. You can address these points as much as you want. Do it until your face turns blue and then purple. They don't automatically make you correct as a result. It doesn't matter how liable Peter is in the situation. He is not the one currently casting the spell, nor does he have all of the necessary foresight and knowledge that Strange has in order to proceed happily along with the spell. If Strange stops casting the spell right there, sits Peter down and has him write out all of the names of the people he wants to know his secret identity, or even if Peter and Strange discuss the parameters of the spell to prevent another mistake from happening, then the multiverse is not put in danger, you crack fiend. If you want to argue Peter is irresponsible or reckless with how quickly he wants the spell to take place, then sure, you can make that criticism. However, considering the situation Peter finds himself in, it feels entirely within his character to want the spell to succeed. If you want to bring up how he could have asked MIT to reconsider the application, allow me to counter that by saying he didn't know at the time and was only working with the information he had access to. This is again an issue which is to be directed at Strange for not mentioning the second option earlier before casting the first spell. No matter which way you look at it, Strange in this scene is a colossal moron and he endangered the safety of not only his universe but every other universe that had a Peter Parker present for no good reason. All Peter wanted to do was get into college, you deranged celery stick. I mean, Strange specifically tells Peter that he could have asked MIT to reconsider and got mad at him that he didn't, so this spell was not the only choice Peter had, like the weird tangent you went on about Dormammu. How the hell do you compare these two things? Dormammu was in the process of eating the planet. It was a blink and you die situation they called for Strange to act as fast as possible. This mind wiping spell can be done a fucking week later and the outcome would be no different. How the hell did you come to the conclusion that Madvocate was suggesting this, you tumble drying toenail? Let's move on, shall we? Now earlier I mentioned CinemaSins made two actual valid criticisms. This is the second one. Honestly, this Doctor Strange vs. Spider-Man mini Civil War shouldn't even be a challenge, but Spidey somehow comes out on top in the end. And what did Birdman have to say about this? This comes across as if you think Spider-Man cannot defeat Doctor Strange in a battle, which is weird considering they are literally showing you Spider-Man defeating him in a battle. What the fuck is this defense? Think, Birdman. Maybe Jeremy is highlighting that based on what we've seen Strange is able to do, the writers intentionally made him an inconsistent moron with his abilities so that Peter can actually have a chance at winning. I... I don't know what you want. You try to use the in-universe explanations to attempt to debunk my arguments, yes. and then you get upset when that same universe shows you one character beating another. Because that... No, that's what we call an inconsistency. Whoa, that is a man, contradiction. You almost figured out the definition oh of an inconsistency. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So you just this you were so do you just close. accept you were anything? So close. Do you just accept anything you that so happens close. to you in, in in the film? If, regardless of how uh, bad it is, this is the kind of person that would enjoy Lucy. Uh, <laughs> excuse me, sir. Yes. But what would happen if, for some reason, we ignore somebody unlocked one hundred percent of the cerebral capacity? One hundred percent. Yes. This comes across as if you think Spider-Man cannot defeat Doctor Strange in a battle, which is weird considering they are literally showing you Spider-Man defeating him in a battle. I have no idea. What a load of bullshit. Because that's what I'm saying, that here is the movie showing you one possible way in which Spider-Man can defeat Doctor Strange. That's it. Yes, I'm quite a big fan of the fact Steven basically forgot every single ability he used against Thanos in Infinity War, including the Naruto Shadow Clone Jutsu. I just love it when previously established competent and powerful characters just lose any and all sense of reason in the middle of their fights in order to prop up the new guy. It's my fucking favorite. Spider-Man is simply too fast for Strange and has precognition. This was shown at the end of the film when Goblin tried to kill Strange and basically all the Spider-Men reacted before Strange could even think. And hilarious you reference the shot where Strange doesn't actually see the attack because he's focused on the box. Two Spider-Men do nothing but stare. You gotta love this guy's logic. Of course! He's saying, in this scene, 
that Strange doesn't see the attack because he's focused on the box. Yes. So in that entire time, Strange just is not noticing these attacks coming towards him and he's just focused on the box. That, that's what you're saying. Yes. That everybody else is reacting and he's just, you know, just gonna, I'm just gonna focus on this box real fast. Yes. He doesn't even look up and hear Goblin saying, can the Spider-Man come out to play? I'm just gonna focus on this box real fast. I'm sorry, Birdman, but Goblin did not break his concentration. Strange was a little preoccupied trying to stop the multiverse crashing spell currently in between his fingies and didn't have time to notice the fucking Goblin bats coming his way, especially since he allegedly had three Spider-Man watching his back. This is a goofy argument. So apparently, Doctor Strange is so focused on his box, he doesn't even hear that. Oh no, a catchphrase from a random villain appearing out of nowhere. I wonder if that is anywhere near as important as the literal franchise baby maker 3000 he has strapped to his hands. Oh, and by the way, he says the other two Spider-Man aren't reacting, but he shows them reacting. Looking at something is a reaction, moron. What, what the fuck do you think the word react means? React to a stimulus. Your eyes, react to things that move. In response, your head may move. That's a reaction, you goof. I don't think I have seen an argument this pathetic before in my life. Y yes, this includes anything Cosmo has said, at least from memory. What Madvocat says here doesn't disprove your comments of them reacting to a visual stimulus. He is pointing out how, despite seeing the attack coming, they do nothing to prevent the bats from hitting Strange and have to rely on Otto Octavius to deflect the blast. This is a nothing burger of a defense and is basically a case of you arguing semantics with someone who didn't even say you were wrong in the initial video. The reason it doesn't matter is because because you have yet to disprove the fact that Otto Octavius was the one to catch these bats in the first place. Tom, Andrew, and Toby may have seen the attack coming, but did fuck all to stop it. And no amount of uh, <clears throat> but actually ing is going to change that fact. Stop presenting your bowel movements as arguments in your response videos. Super weird for somebody to say, oh, they're not reacting to a thing and then show literal video evidence of them reacting to something. Perhaps if you washed the Disney jizz out of your ears, you would be able to figure out Madvocate said nothing about them not reacting. He said all they did was stare, acknowledging that they did react to a visual stimulus, but that they did absolutely nothing to stop the attack. You are putting words into his mouth, Birdman, and I don't tolerate bad faith arguments. I didn't say they jumped in the way to stop the fucking flying pumpkins. I'm saying they reacted to it. Like, th their body moved and you showed evidence of that. Isn't it just super convenient that you can make this defense due to how flimsy your wording tends to be? Like, sure, you could make this argument and it would technically be correct, but in the spirit of the statement and of the defense you were trying to make, it's entirely malnourished. Your argument was that Spider-Man was too fast strange and used this scene as an example of them speed blitzing strange before he could even react. Your argument is not reliant on them solely standing still and turning their heads. You are trying to argue they could physically move faster than Strange can think. However, in a sense, this would be correct due to precognition, which is an advantage Peter has over a character like Strange, who, for all intents and purposes, is just supposed to be a normal guy with godlike abilities. The problems come in when Strange is able to outperform characters like Spider-Man and Thor against Thanos. Strange was doing a better job fighting against Thanos by himself than he did alongside the assistance of the Guardians as well as Spider-Man, despite supposedly having having a significantly slower reaction speed to Spider-Man. Are you also forgetting the fact that Strange and Peter fought in this film and that the only reason Peter won in the first place was because Strange is a complete fucking idiot? If Peter really is just that much faster than Strange, why did he struggle in this encounter? Oh, why do I even bother? You're probably going to reply to this with some incredibly asinine response like because the writers wanted him to win or some BS like that. The substandard, defeatist, comic book slash fanboy mentality you see plaguing the entirety of this industry. It's abysmal behavior and is one of the main contributing factors for why we keep getting this run-of-the-mill sloppy sludge you people call films. It's disgusting. This is a waste of editing, my dude. Do you guys remember Craig the Irony Stone? 
Because the longer this video keeps going, the more I feel Craig's presence growing. What the fuck was that? That was the sound of your brain cells exploding one by one. The reason why you only heard one explosion was because we didn't have much to go through. Hilariously, you referenced the shot where Strange doesn't actually see the attack because he's focused on the box. Two Spider-Men do nothing but stare, one just spins, and the one who actually does something is Otto fucking Octavius, the normal man currently in full control control of the tentacles in the comic book world wh what hold on you might want to actually look up what otto's arms are capable of you don't have to worry about that one bird man i'm a uh, quite well versed on this topic so let's see if my research corresponds with yours shall we those arms have artificial intelligence in them that allow them to move on their own without the input of the driver. This is technically correct since we do see the arms murder an entire hospital while Otto was unconscious, but I don't see how this has anything to do with Madvocate's point here since Otto is controlling the arms. Otto can absolutely override that AI, but- But nothing! That sentence should just stop there because it isn't even fully correct. Otto is capable of overriding the control of the arms as he manages to do exactly that during the finale of Spider-Man 2, thanks to one of the four arms being heavily damaged, as well as with Peter's assistance with reclaiming his humanity. But this isn't something Otto needs to do in order to control the arms. Doctor, if the artificial intelligence in the arms is as advanced as you suggest, uh, couldn't that make you vulnerable to them? All right, you are. Which is why I developed this inhibitor chip to protect my higher brain function. It means I maintain control of these arms instead of them controlling me. They still act independently of the driver. Not when he's conscious, they don't. They don't even act independently when they are in control of him. They have to convince him to finish building the new reactor and get him to become a criminal as a result. Designing the arms to act independently of his own actions also seems like an incredibly fatal design flaw if he needs them to operate exactly how he wants them to during an operation like this. And for the love of God, don't you dare try and use arrogance as an excuse if that is genuinely a point you wanted to make. Considering the only evidence you use of them acting independently of Otto's will is the one scene where he is unconscious, I fail to see how you can even support these claims unless you have fourth dimensional knowledge of the Eldritch variety that I am just not familiar with. Can you actually pierce into the minds of the people involved with this project in order to make these ass pull claims you diuretic arcade machine? The chip was placed on Otto's neck in Spider-Man 2 to prevent them from completely taking over because again they can move on their own. Even in the image you used to back up your claim, the the article says that Otto programmed the arms to continue operating if he is unconscious. It also says they will whisk his unconscious body away to safety in order to wait for him to wake up. Your primary, no, your only piece of evidence undermines the point you are trying to make, you thumpy go-kart. How are you this incompetent at defending yourself that you willingly provide me with the evidence to counter your own claim? Do it right fucking now. Redraft the damn script please the scene you're showing is the arms protecting strange and otto from blowing up you can literally see otto being moved against his will there <laughs> his body moves like a passenger in a car when you're the driver of the car you know the maneuvers you're going to make so when you make a maneuver your body kind of braces and you know you don't move as much but the person in the passenger seat is just flying all over the place same exact thing here. Birdman, do, do you know what inertia is? The reason why Otto's body moves like that is because his body is resisting a change in velocity. Why do you think Spider-Man's body curves in the opposite direction to where he swings most of the time? Do you think his torso is just a passenger to his own wrist? Do you think drivers of motor vehicles just stay in a stationary position whenever they turn? Does gravity just fail to affect them because they are operating the vehicle? You egg. Now tell me, does Otto look like the driver? Yes, he looks like the driver of the arms he is in full control of. Or the passenger. Bitch, I just fucking told you, pay attention! In the comic book world, we call this getting statued, which means you are orders of magnitude slower than your opponent, which means you would probably be killing the speed blitz. When Peter gets serious, this guy can defeat the likes of Fire Lord, a herald of Galactic. And that is where I will stop taking Birdman seriously. He says, Oh no, a guy I've never heard of. It stopped taking me. Get to the fucking point, dude. Like, nobody cares. Come on. Well, maybe if you didn't pause him in the middle of his points, then you would be able to hear him make it. 
crazy thought, I know, but with the power of friendship, anime, and a whole heap of god, maybe you too can get to the point. Calling Strange a fucking idiot for not going over the rules of the spell is an out-of-universe criticism, yet he uses out-of-universe content to support his defense. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, that was my fault. I chewed out his electrical wires trying to kill myself so I didn't have to keep watching this. I'll put it back on, just just give me a second. <sighs> Is it working yet? I, I can't tell if he hasn't said anything. What? Okay, I swear I turned him back on. If he isn't working as intended, then either he's programmed by Todd Howard or he's just a fucking idiot. I'm also more than willing to flip that coin. Those are two completely different topics. No, they they aren't. They both deal with inconsistency in the writing, whether one is purely character focused or if it's ability focused, doesn't really matter since they both affect the quality of the overall writing of the scene. You are gatekeeping what is okay again, you ass. When I was talking about Watsonian versus Doylist, who? I was talking about characterization. You know, the thing you have a problem with with Doctor Strange in this movie? Did you miss the part where Madvik had said every passing second of Strange's screen time was an insult to consistency? Not just his character, but also the magic that comes with him? It was the first point you responded to, Birdman. How, how did you forget that? Flashback. Doctor Strange is the worst part about this movie, with pretty much every passing second of his screen time being an insult to consistency and intelligence. <laughs> Not just his character, but the magic that comes with him. End of flashback. However, in this instance, I'm referring to ability, as in the physical attributes of the characters in question. I genuinely hope you are going to bring up the fact Peter has radioactive cum in the comics. I'm, I'm not even kidding. Please mention it. Spider-Man being incredibly fast is an immutable ability of that character, like him sticking to walls or having spider sense. Can you please cite an instance of movie Spider-Man being so fast that he can speed blitz another person? I'm not talking about him dodging out of the way of gunfire, I mean being so fast that the other person can't even register what he is doing. And once you have done that, can you please explain each and every single one of these scenes? What follows is a brief construction montage. Hey! Oh, this feels so weird! Oh, my butt! Hey, buddy, I think you lost this! Yes! <laughs> that was awesome! What's up, Mr. Stark? Kid, where'd you come from? The field trip to Nova! Ah! Whoa, 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 whoa. Please don't put your eggs in me! Ah! Uh! Magic! Four magic! Magic with a kid! Magic with a... Insect. Hungry? Oh, so sorry. Take Thor for a quick example. Oh yes, please do talk about the comic book character who can literally travel back in time through just his sheer speed. I'm sure that won't cause any potential issues when discussing his film appearances. In the comics, he's a fairly serious character. In the MCU, he's kind of a joke. That just depends on the director, cause I didn't find myself laughing at him much in Infinity War. I didn't really laugh at him either in Endgame, I just found him kinda sad, which is, which I guess was the point. His first few appearances in the MCU also had him acting pretty seriously, even though there were a few odd parts of comedy thrown in. It's only recently with his appearances in films such as Thor Ragnarok and Love and Thunder where I can see you making that argument, but even in those films, he has moments where he behaves earnestly without the moment being undercut by a joke. If you want to paint the character as a whole as a joke, then go for it. There's plenty of material to use in order to support that claim, but I don't think it's fair to ignore the stuff which points to a version of Thor that isn't a giant goofball. But that is his characterization. In the MCU, that is how the writers wrote him. But comic Thor and MCU Thor both can control lightning. Oh yeah, both can wield lightning. But I wonder which one of them can do it better. They're both incredibly strong. They both wield Mjolnir, something 
most people in that universe cannot do. But do both versions wield Stormbreaker, a weapon that was originally called Yon Björn. No, I don't care if I pronounce that correctly. In the comics, with the name Stormbreaker belonging to the weapon Beta Ray Bill used. A character, mind you, that isn't currently in the MCU despite Thor's axe having the same name. And would you like to discuss certain aspects of Thor's hammer that are just, you know, mildly different between adaptations? How about the fact that in the comics Mjolnir is fast enough that it can cross every single realm in the universe within moments after being summoned by Thor? Realms which are low ball to be galaxies in terms of size. Compare that to the movie version of Mjolnir, which can barely break past the Earth's outer atmosphere in a couple of seconds. How about the fact that in the comics, Thor's hammer is considered to be beyond time and space, with the idea of time being irrelevant to Thor, which you know, makes sense considering he can literally travel through time using his speed alone. An ability which automatically makes him more powerful than any character in the MCU so far with maybe the exception of Kang. Now I need to ask you something, are these traits immutable aspects of Thor's character, or are you just going to simplify these feats by saying, both versions of Thor are just super fast. If any of you would like to know more about just how powerful comic book Thor is compared to the MCU, then I have linked a video by Chuck where he explains many of his best feats of strength and durability, such as the fact Thor is capable of hurting characters who are described as outerversal beings, makes you wonder why he struggled with Iron Man in the first Avengers film, doesn't it? At the end of the day, I don't exactly want to have a nerd battle over who has read more of these stupid fucking books. I just wanted to point out how befuddling your standards and comparisons are once we take a look at them beyond the surface level stuff like he's fast or he's strong. Like, yeah, cool. I could also have just watched the movie to figure that part out. You moldy onion. Therefore, I am justified in using the comics to at least explain the power set. Do you see the difference now? I see you making shallow and superficial comparisons between adaptations of characters with wildly different power levels simply so that you can gatekeep what is and isn't okay to talk about. The difference between you and Madvocate is that he doesn't need to resort to books 95% of the people who have seen No Way Home would not have read in order to half ass a defense he was still wrong about. Believe me, I see the difference. Characterization versus power set. Well structured and delivered arguments, bitch fits. Also, this isn't even accounting for some of the silly and goofy shit Doctor Strange can do in the comics. If you think Spider-Man is speed blitzing classic Strange, then all I have to say is <laughs> Chuck has also made a video on Strange, which will be linked in the description if you're interested in finding out what makes Stephen Strange, the Sorcerer Supreme, one of the most powerful characters in fiction. Yes, you heard that right. He could likely beat up Goku. Maybe, I haven't really been keeping up. Not once did I bring up the comics to explain personality traits, and you can only discount the comics when discussing the movies if the movies themselves contradict that power set. So what you are saying is radioactive cum. That's a no, right? Like Miss Marvel. Who? Oh my bad, the following sin is also valid. Final by the Peter somehow uses his Parker prescience combined with geometry to figure out how to pull this off. But why does that immediately mute Strange's ability to bend this dimension to his will? Just like Thanos in the Infinity Gauntlet, you're not understanding one needs to use hand gestures to perform magic. No, they don't. Just leave me out of this. Where do they do have to go? Fail. Now, now, let him finish. He might surprise you by providing you exactly the kind of reference clips he just showed on screen before you uttered that phrase. So, what are the moves that break this fight entirely? Wait, hold on, fail. God fucking damn it. <sighs> You're showing interdimensional portals, which, while admittedly are inconsistent in the MCU at best, they are not magic. Wait, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? They are not magic. One more time, it's hard to hear you with all the blood in my ears. They are not magic. Mystical, adjective. Definition of mystical, having a spiritual meaning or reality that is neither apparent to the senses nor obvious to the intelligence. The mystical food of the sacrament, involving or having the nature of an individual's direct subjective communion with God or ultimate reality. The mystical experience of the inner light, mysterious and intelligible, mystic, sense two, mystic, sense three.
You claim that these magic portals are in fact not magic, and your only piece of evidence for this was a screenshot from a wiki page which outright calls them magic portals. I actually think it's physically impossible for a person to be this stupid, and yet you keep surprising me. You just just keep playing the video for fucking hell. Because they are wormholes and can be opened through science. However, Jeremy was not talking about these portals. You literally play him saying, bend this dimension to his will, meaning he's referring to the mirror dimension. Ah, but Birdman, you are forgetting something. Madvocate isn't responding to CinemaSins. I'll replay that sequence again for you, slowly, just so you can figure out who exactly he is responding to. Just like Thanos in the Infinity Gauntlet, you're not understanding one needs to use hand gestures to perform magic. No, they don't. Just leave me out of this. See, Birdman, Madvocate was responding directly to you in this instance, being that he was countering the claim you needed to perform hand gestures in order to use magic. He supported this counterclaim by providing scenes of characters using portal magic without their hands, and then later goes on to talk about more spells Strange can use without his hands, directly providing primary evidence which supports his argument of saying Strange as a character should be able to break this fight in half even without the use of his hands. Do you understand the premise yet? And how does Strange manipulate the mirror dimension? Let's take a look. Let's look at other instances of magic being used in the MCU. That's not in the MCU, but I'll allow it. It doesn't matter anyways, not unless you can counter the examples Madvika gives, which are directly from this film. R remember what I said about you getting a blue and purple face? Uh, yeah, just, just great job. Fant fantastic effort. Keep it up. I think I'll go grab Craig now. Make sure you're doing boxes and shapes with just your fingers. Jojo is doing fight scenes. I make the gestures to materialize these weapons and powers, gestures to materialize these weapons and powers. Gesture, noun, definition of gesture, a movement usually of the body or limbs that expresses or emphasizes an idea, sentiment, or attitude, raised his hand overhead in a gesture of triumph. The use of motions of the limbs or body as a means of expression. Something said or done by way of formality or courtesy, as a symbol or token, or for its effect on the attitudes of others. A political gesture to draw popular support. Carriage, bearing, archaic, or gesture, verb. To make a gesture, well, that's really fucking helpful. Or to express or direct by a gesture. So, what are the moves that break this fight entirely and disprove the Birdman's defenses? Whoa. Oh. Wait, wait, wait. Yes, you saw that correctly. Strange doesn't need to manually take away the box from Peter. This my, like, you can't be serious. He literally shows Strange using magic gestures with his hands. Madvocate is showing you an instance of Strange force grabbing his sling ring and other items out of people's hands, which directly contradicts the need to grab the box from Peter by hand, which makes this entire fight meaningless. So therefore, even if Strange needs to use hand gestures, which he doesn't, for literally every single spell, which he doesn't, it wouldn't matter because the fight no longer exists. You colossal chum bucket. Also, implying that Strange is incapable of using his wrists in this position is just... The fuck is wrong with you? S stop it! When you're when you're actually seeing instances of magic, again, those portals are wormholes. I think the wiki even says that you can uh, manipulate those through science. They're not exactly magic, and they need the usage of a sling ring. Meanwhile, your ancestors called it magic, and you call it science. 
Well, I come from a place where they're one and the same thing. The language of the mystic arts is as old as civilization. The sorcerers of antiquity call the use of this language spells. But if that word offends your modern sensibilities, you can call it a program. The source code that shapes reality. Mastery of the sling ring is essential to the mystic arts. They allow us to travel throughout the multiverse. All you need to do is focus, visualize, see the destination in your mind. Look beyond the world in front of you. Imagine every detail. The clearer the picture, the quicker and easier the gateway will come. Being able to manipulate these dimensional portals using methods that don't include the sling ring does not mean they aren't magic in nature, especially since they are wielded by sorcerers. Magic is simply science that we do not understand in this universe. The sorcerers are agents of the universe who manipulate the natural energy that surrounds them and bend it to their will. Sort of like how we use the sun's energy to provide electricity. These mystic arts are capable of being learned by anyone at any time. Even cripples who are unable to walk can manipulate these powers hours, allowing them to heal their bodies. Makes you wonder how that guy used hand gestures when he couldn't even move, but hey, I'm just a silly old squirrel, I don't watch these funny movies so how could I possibly understand them? It's not like they are often factory made to appeal to the lowest common denominator or anything, right? Which is a plot point in this film. No, Mr. Bird, that is not a plot point, that is a plot contrivance. Please learn the difference. But you saw Strange using his hands along with the other examples I just showed. So it, it, what's wrong with this guy? I don't think I actually care enough to continue this barrage of brain cell self-removal. Madvocate has given you a handful of examples of sorcerers using magic without hand gestures. And I've explained why the usage of certain spells negates this entire conflict, even if he had to use his hands. This is a pointless conversation. Just rewind back to those examples if you need to hear them again. Yes, you saw that correctly. Strange doesn't need to manually take away the box from Peter because he can just individually teleport it off or force pull it from him. Comboed up with the fact that Strange can also take an object and turn it into an incarceration gauntlet, and Peter is done for. There is no fight, and the villains are sent home. If you want to argue that Strange can't just convert any object into an incarceration gauntlet, I mean, it doesn't even matter because he literally has the gauntlet Peter used, so Strange could have just put it on himself, but he doesn't use any of these moves. Whoa, no, 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 no. He did not have the gauntlet at that moment. All he did was teleport it from Peter's wrist. Like you can actually see that Strange does not have that gauntlet on his arm. All he did was take it and, and put it in the Sanctum Santorum. <laughs> So, <clears throat> uh, this is an example of Dr. Strange simply underestimating Peter and his abilities. <laughs> does, does this guy look like a guy who respects his opponent? I don't know, Birdman. Why don't I play the scene in its full context to see how seriously Strange takes the situation? Oh, would you look at that? He separates his astral form from his physical form. The exact same trick the Ancient One pulled on Strange himself, as well as Professor Hulk. A move which, for all intents and purposes, should be an instant KO under normal circumstances. But it isn't in this situation because the movie hates consistency. I wonder if Madvocate... Whoa, whoa, wait. Enhance that footage? Enhance. 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 No, 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 not that. You're not dead, you've just been separated from your physical form. My, my physical... What? How are you doing that? I have no idea. You should not... Doctor Strange and Peter Parker have super speed. What the fuck? Let's have a look at other instances in the MCU where astral projection happens. Oh, none of these scenes carry these super speed implications. Good job. Uh, yeah, of course he did. Because Madvocate actually cares about providing accurate information instead of pulling shit out of his ass with tweezers. Uh, yeah, he could have and probably should have used the, uh, the gauntlet that can just teleport him into the, the prison. 
Please don't say but. Please don't say but. You were so close. You were on the precipice of understanding the issue and making a valid point. Come on, Batman. Please, please. I believe in you. We we believe in you. Come on. But again. Motherfucker. But again, he's underestimating Peter Parker here, which is exactly in line with what I was saying about him not doing things correctly that is a really long way of saying mentally deficient bum cheese. It also does not line up with what you say because no more than five seconds later, Strange uses his instant KO ability on Peter. The scene flip flops between him being competent or redundant just so we can get comic accuracy to appease the glue sniffers in the crowd who will literally clap at fucking anything if it comes wrapped up in a neat enough bow. Am I potentially insulting members of my own audience? Yes. Does that change how I feel about this? No. If you like garbage and you enjoyed watching the film then you know what good good for you i have nothing but respect for you just don't throw shit in my eye and expect me to call it glitter <coughs> this is vile you'll learn to love it the first time that that's my whole point is, is the reason why you included me in this fucking trash ass video it's ironic hello hi hi and don't pull a Birdman and say Peter is too fast and would have just dodged the shots because A, he failed to react to it earlier, and B, there are several moments- Terrible fucking logic. You're Motherfucker, I'm nearly done with this BS. Please stop being a one-wheeled red wagon and let the man finish his point before you interrupt him. Your, your logic is- Jesus Christ. Okay, so what you're saying is he failed to account for something- in a non-combat situation. The fuck do you mean a non-combat situation? Do, do you expect him, no, do you expect me to believe that anytime he even passively uses his Peter Tingle, he's accounting for the possibility he might have to fight someone instead of, you know, just having access to another enhanced sense? There have been a handful of situations where Peter casually catches something he can't see despite the object in question posing zero threat to him, and you want to argue the reason he did this was because he was ready to box someone. What? So Peter wasn't trying to fight. He wasn't, he didn't have his attention on Doctor Strange. He was looking straight at him, you scrambled brick. According to your own point, Peter has super speed advanced enough to speed blitz Strange's own reaction speed to the point he would end up being statued. Can you please pick an argument and stick to it? He didn't know what the fuck he was doing with that on his arm. And so your logical conclusion was that Peter would just be fine with whatever Strange did to him because he didn't know what it was? <laughs> ah, you, you just, you just radiate fucking stupid! He's putting water in the reactor core! Somebody stop him! He's making it worse! And you're somehow using that as an instance of Peter can be caught with this thing. Well, he also uses a few examples of viable options to catch Peter with the one weapon Strange knows can teleport him with zero issue, but I guess this is what happens when you interrupt someone in the middle of their points. And yes, I am aware some of you will be saying, but Shandy, you are doing the exact same thing. I know, I know, and it's great. It's absolutely fantastic that I could do this and he can't, because I have already seen his video and I know what he will be saying next. This motherfucker couldn't even get 10 seconds into Madvocate's video. It's incredibly stupid for a variety of reasons, but I'll just leave it at he wasn't in a combat situation and it's very hard to tag Peter Parker with something twice. So what exactly is Stephen Strange, the master of the mystic arts, just not supposed to even try and hit Peter again with this device because he might miss? Is that seriously the answer you are making here? He, he might miss with an object of power that has no ammo in a dimension he controls, or while Peter is in a situation where he can't physically move anything other than his arms. Imagine if we applied this defense consistently across the appearances in the MCU. No, Captain America, don't try to fight Peter. You've already tagged him once, so it's going to be very difficult to keep doing that. Hey, Thanos, yeah, big guy, I'm talking to you. You've already hit this insect. It's practically impossible for him to be hit again. So just surrender the stones. Okay, you might get him one time. The second time though, good luck. B, there are several moments throughout the fight where he is compromised and would be unable to avoid it. Like when he's stuck right here, while he's being astral projected. Like when he's stuck here. This is another stupid point. Strange caught him when he was stuck right there. 
This is the scene he separated him from his physical body, and he again underestimates Peter and his abilities, losing his grip on him. No, 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 no. You cannot simultaneously play the scene of Strange using the instant KO move while suggesting he is not taking Peter seriously. This is a no-go operation, you twinkling trog. Strange has just played his trump card. There is no other spell he has access to that will be able to capture Spider-Man this easily besides maybe the mirror dimension. And even that didn't work. D do you honestly expect to convince literally anyone that Strange is taking Peter lightly after putting him in the fucking mirror dimension. The same place he tried to trap Kaecilius and Wanda fucking Maximoff in. Stop being such a half-baked sardine. Please, I beg you, the video is nearly done. Kinda like how he did with Thanos and the time gem, jumping into the fray without necessarily thinking. That's my point. I refuse to reiterate my previous statements. I just want to move on and I want to leave this video behind me. And you're not letting me. That's what I'm saying. It's his characterization. Being astral projected like when he's stuck here. And I just want to point out here that uh, Peter is not stuck. Like you can literally see he's shooting his own webs. He can release those at any time. Oh yeah, release the webs and continue falling down a hole that never ends. I'm sure that's a great way to keep the box in his possession. He's not stuck. And the cherry on top of the Strange is a moron cake? Instead of immediately pushing the button once he has the box, Strange takes 14 seconds to tell Peter he'll come back for him, open a portal, and stop to watch Peter's web creation before getting caught in it. Not to mention he chose to open and there you have it, folks, a CinemaSins level deconstruction of a scene. Okay, now tell me why he's wrong. Just like Jeremy, this baloney sandwich of a YouTuber. It's not baloney. This, this is, is baloney. Is failing to understand something that is happening at the same time. While Strange is flying away, Spider-Man is doing his thing in the background. They can't show you this because this is a movie and there is only one screen. So they show you two events and then the outcome of those events. What you're asking for is for them to have a fucking split screen and show these two things happening at the same time for you to understand that they're happening at the same time. Oh no, so instead of taking 14 seconds to get out of there, he takes what, nine seconds, seven? What would the correct number be here, Birdman, before you can safely say that it doesn't fucking matter? Because do you know what happens when Strange presses the button on the box? An action which would literally, not figuratively, not potentially, literally take one second. The movie ends. Jesus fucking Christ, you can't even understand movie events that are happening non-linearly and we're supposed to take what you say about this movie seriously? Yes. Yeah, thanks, but no thanks. Oh no, the dude who didn't know what Mystic meant said he wasn't going to take Madvocate seriously in a video he couldn't get 10 seconds into. The horror. That was such a bad, terribly bad video, Birdman. Like, I cannot overstate this, but you suck at your job. Please take that as personally or as seriously as you can. I want you to know, deep in your stomach, that you did not do a good job and you should have deleted this before it was even uploaded. Oh, but ladies and gents, we are not yet done. No, no, we still have one more video left and I'm told it's better than the live reaction because this video is scripted. Who told me it was better? Well, Birdman did in the comment section of this video. Well, he, he didn't outright say it was better, he just said that he can make more compelling arguments if it's scripted. Although, considering that one of your core arguments relied on a piece of content which did not share direct continuity with the film version of Strange and basically sucked in every aspect I can think of, I'm going to take a leap and a bound and suggest that there is a possibility that this video is better, even if just slightly. Let's hope I'm right. Oh, who am I kidding? We all know this isn't a live reaction, so yeah, I know what I'm getting into. So a few days ago, your old Uncle Birdman got into a spat with another creator here on YouTube. Yeah, I wouldn't really call it a spat. More like you getting demonstrably outclassed by a creator who didn't even focus on you for a majority of their content. You tried desperately to salvage some sort of respectability despite not really needing to, and as such you came off as an incompetent buffoon who dangerously needs to reconsider going back to middle school in order to grasp some sort of reading comprehension. 
comprehension skills, since that was never your strongest trait. Neither is writing, apparently. Despite having a subscriber count which is 70,000 people larger, your video only has a fifth of the views Madvocate had, but about 200 more dislikes, even though Madvocate didn't link your channel. I wonder if it was possible that you took issue with him doing that, despite claiming in the past that you would not link someone else's content in order to protect them from harassment, that you were better than that. And for some reason, you couldn't bring yourself to acknowledge there was even a possibility Madvocate did that for the very same reason. No, of course not, because Madvocate is an arsehole who superimposed an image of your face on Park Kent. The topic under discussion was my Spider-Man No Way Home video where I make a few refutations against CinemaSins' claims about one Doctor Strange. There were a lot of things said, but one of the main arteries in the body that was that argument was the characterization of Doctor Strange. While you are correct in this assessment, we should not forget the other main artery, if you want to call it that, which was Strange's inconsistent and idiotic usage of magic, especially when in comparison to his other film appearances. In fact, Madvocate's initial point against Strange was to disperse the arguments that magic is allowed to be as inconsistent as it wishes. I'm sure you remember that part, right? When you forgot that rules and restrictions are not only capable of being placed but are regularly present in order to make magic viable? Otherwise, everyone ends up becoming a classic comics Doctor Strange, a person who can literally defeat the embodiments of infinity and eternity, while also being fast enough to cross universes in an instant. But I'm sure you'd still argue Spider-Man was faster because of reasons, I guess. Only the most dedicated of comic book sniffing retards are allowed to say what is and isn't allowed in these conversations. And I'm sure I'm not going to be able to stop myself gut laughing once you show me how dedicated you are. Namely, that Doctor Strange was an inconsistent character in his appearances throughout the MCU. I, of course, argued that Strange has been shown to be impetuous in basically every single one of his appearances and that he misuses magic in a way that has consequences later down the line. Badly. You argued your position badly. Your references in favor of your arguments were bad. Your desire to one-up Madvocate by contradicting your own arguments was bad. Your video is cringe. In layman's terms, Doctor Strange is the same person in all his movie appearances and his actions taken in No Way Home were in character. Oh no, if only Madvocate had accounted for a similar argument. Before going over the strategic genius Strange is in battle, it ought to be discussed why he and Peter battle in the first place. After Peter learns Norman, Otto, and Max will die fighting Spider-Man when they're sent back, he wants to give them all a second chance. A chance to cure them with the very advanced MCU technology. And therefore, hopefully, saving them when they return. And what does Strange have to say about this? I swore an oath to do no harm, and I have just killed a man. I'm not doing that again. You're a coward. Because I'm not a killer? These zealots will snuff us all out, and you can't muster the strength to snuff them first? What do you think I just did? You saved your own life! Oh, and you would have done it so easy. Without hesitation. Even if there's another way. There is no other way. You lack imagination. Wait, sorry, wrong movie. It's their fate. It's their fate. You can't change that any more than you could change who they are. If they die, they die. Excellent. Not only is he contradicting his own morals and Peter's, but ain't this the same motherfucker who took a peek into 14 million futures to see which one would give half the universe the fate of returning rather than sticking to his principles and instincts, which would have been to protect the stone even at the expense of Tony and Peter's lives? And he of all people should be more understanding of what being given a second chance can do to a person. Too bad he's ditched his morals in favor of a pathetic CGI fight and to remove his him from the film for the plot. Oh hey, look at that, he, he does, yay. I made three points in defense of this position. Two points which ignored context around why Strange made certain character decisions as well as displacing events in your mind. And then the magical third argument which literally no one fucking cares about. If you find me an example of someone who does, even if it is yourself, I regret to inform you, but it's not real. None of it is. This was a mind control experiment conducted by the CIA. You are currently in an abandoned warehouse crawling around on circles due to an LSD overdose and will soon wake up in a hospital with no memory of who you are under someone else's name. That or I'm being hyperbolic. Strange has literally been characterized as a person who constantly makes mistakes with me. <laughs> Apparently, this was a ridiculous take to some. Well, yeah, it's just that your evidence didn't really help either. Also, not really trying to poison the weather here, but um, 
Based? So, let's talk Doctor Strange. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Let's Talk, the series where we see way more than 14 million possibilities. But only if you ignore context in order to prop up your interpretation as the bestest, most goodest one there is. This is your friendly neighborhood, Birdman, and today we're going to explore Doctor Strange and the multiverse of inconsistency. Oh no, the only thing that could possibly be worse than Mom. Boy. First things first, we have to establish a baseline for Strange's personality. Oh, that's kind of an easy one, really. He used to be an arrogant surgeon who prided himself on never making a mistake and had a genius level intellect, something he used to deflect criticisms of his behavior. However, after he suffered a serious accident, he tried seeking out answers in the mystic arts, which led to him confronting his own arrogance, learning that he has much more to learn and to give if he simply looked past his own ego. In doing so, he accepted that he will never be perfect and understood compromises needed to be made in order to achieve success. With his newly found knowledge, he accomplished the means of becoming the most powerful sorcerer in the universe, potentially the multiverse. In Infinity War, we saw how far he progressed in his studies and in his devotion to the Order he was now a part of, being willing to sacrifice his own life and potentially the lives of his companions in order to protect the Infinity Stone, he now adorned as a weapon against evil, indicating the exponential growth of his powers, a feat that was only possible thanks to him taking the Ancient One's advice and letting go of his own ego and arrogance. That, that was it, yeah, the, the established baseline the movies gave us. In fucking 4K, you gronk. And what better way to do that than with his original film appearance? Have I become the sorcerer? You should learn whose powers to respect. Come along for a fantastic adventure into the fourth dimension with Doctor Strange. N no, not that one. This one. Unfunny joke is unfunny, but knowing Birdman's typical defenses, there was a strong possibility he would unironically use this film as an argument. Thankfully, though, that adaptation isn't allowed. For some reason, I guess. In the first Doctor Strange, we learn that Steven is cocky, arrogant, smug, and completely confident in his own abilities. Yeah, when he was a world famous surgeon, and then... What did they do? But I see through you! You became a doctor to save one life above all others, your own. Still seeing through me, are you? I see what I've always seen. You are overinflated ego. You have such a capacity for goodness. You always excelled, but not because you craved success, but because of your fear of failure. It's what made me a great doctor. It's precisely what kept you from greatness. Arrogance and fear still keep you from learning the simplest and most significant lesson of all. Which is? It's not about you. You will never win. No, but I can lose again and again. And again, and again, forever. And that makes you my prisoner. Yeah, you know, you really should have stolen the whole book because the warnings, the warnings come after the spells. You'll wear the eye of Akimoto once you've mastered its powers. Until then, best not to walk the streets wearing an infinity stone. A what? You might have a gift for the mystic gods, but you still have much to learn. You, you get the picture. Hey, it sounds a lot like the Birdman. Your fucking Twitter profile is a selfie of you and you had the audacity to get angry at Madvocat for using your fucking face, you twat! Well, being as callous as he was, Strange nearly kills himself driving a way too fast sports car down a way too small road. This is the first piece of evidence we have that shows Strange does not think about things clearly. I mean, driving a Lambo on this pitiful piece of road? Everyone knows you can only do this if you're in a Dodge Charger and talk about family all day. <laughs> unfunny Family Guy meme is unfunny. But why exactly would you use a version of Strange before he goes through his arc as evidence for why Strange behaves a certain way after his arc? It contradicts the entire point of the arc, that he learns to stop being such an incredible ass and develop a sense of personal responsibility and accountability. Your first point is already weapons grade plutonium. However, this is when things get serious for Strange and his life spirals out of control because he can no longer use his hands. 
you've probably seen this movie already. You would be correct in this assumption, which is why I'm confused as to why you just tried to gaslight me into thinking Strange didn't learn his lessons. So I'll spare you the long history lesson. Strange looks for a way to cure his hands, finds the Harry Potter equivalent of Caillou, and she teaches him how to do magic by throwing up gang signs. The ending of this movie is what we are most interested in, where we see that Strange cleverly comes up with a solution to an extra-dimensional monster named Yo Mama. <laughs> and traps him in a time loop with an infinity gem that causes him to abandon his invasion of Earthrealm. He then uses the time gem to reverse the damage to Hong Kong and the Hong Kong Sanctum. Oh, and as an aside, I refer to the infinity gems as gems because I'm a comic book purist. You know, I think I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about myself. Ever since I was a young cub, I was very adventurous. I climbed many tall trees, glided across vast caverns, and eventually learned to swim across entire lakes, and eventually enormous oceans. I traveled to many great and distant lands, met some of the most interesting people you'll ever see, and learned three languages. I've seen a lot in my time, but despite everything I've accomplished, and everything I've discovered, not once have I ever come across a single person who asked. As in, I'm a guy that literally still goes to comic book shops in 2022 and buys actual comic books. Hey guys, look, he buys comic books in 2022. See, nobody cares. What do you guys think of this variant of Lethal Protector number one? I really like this one. Oh, hey guys, excuse me while I move all of this rubbish out of the way so I can show you my comic book collection that I definitely still read and haven't just forgotten existed. I'm currently in my room, you know, that's my PC, my my monitors, my, my, my glass is currently full of the amount of fucks I give about your comics obsession. But hey, look, look over there, a, a comic book that's actually in my house, my, my physical home, not in a comic book store because literally anyone can pretend to buy a comic book. Hey, look, we, we got a few Spider-Man books. You know, I, I acquired them as a kid. Just some standard stuff you purchase for a few cents at like a yard sale or in a pharmacy while you're waiting for some headache tablets. Got a, got a big ass Deadpool collection that is my brother's. Uh, I haven't read more than two pages of that thing. Um, got a few issues of the Thunderbolts that I did actually read and I like them quite a lot because they look cool. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we got, we got the comic book adaptations of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, but, um, uh, not, not the first one because I couldn't find it and I was quite upset, but, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's my actual collection in my house. Uh, ignore all of the empty bottles. I definitely didn't drink a lot getting through this, but, uh, yeah, this is, this is where I actually live. This is my desk that I repeatedly abuse every time I hear you speak. This is my keyboard. I used to type out my scripts. This is my mouse. I used, you know, to find all the information to clarify anything you said as being incorrect, as well as, you know, just watching the content I talk about because that, that, that was so fucking hard to do. Anyway, while this action was a solution to a problem, it also created another. Baron. Carl. Amadeus. Mordo. I don't, I don't have the problem, you fucking have the problem, I can quit anytime, go, go stuff yourself, you fuck! You see, after Strange saved the Earth, Mordo says this. We did it. That's Chong, you idiot. Yes. Oh, he meant this guy, uh, never mind. By also violating the natural law. Things that are outside of or beyond nature do not adhere to physical laws, therefore there is no way to quantify them or explain them. You still think there will be no consequences, Strange? No price to pay. The bill comes due. Always. Carl's point here is that- Oh yes, please tell me what the point was for the character I just heard speak. This is very necessary. The Earth was supposed to be destroyed, and that this was the natural order, and that Strange abusing time will eventually lead to something far worse. Whoa, 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 hang on. Um, for someone who thinks the world should have ended, he definitely went about expressing that sentiment in a peculiar manner, considering that in the entirety of the 10 minute time this scene takes place in, not once did he vocalize his discontentment with Strange fixing the planet. In fact, based on his actions, one could assume he wanted the exact opposite Thing to happen. However, considering that Mordo had to abandon his principles in order for this to happen, he naturally wasn't very happy about it. During this scene with Strange, 
Mordor uses the newly formed zealots as a primary piece of evidence for why one does not contend with magic, which defies natural law, because it will always bring forth consequences. He said this moments before being complicit in the exact same magic he took personal grievances with, and as such, he abandoned Kamataj because it no longer reflected his values. A temple to hypocrisy and broken promises were all that was left to him, and he did not wish to be a part of it, especially since he believes the actions of Strange and the Ancient One would bring forth even more drastic consequences. Not once did he state or even imply that he thought the world should have ended, you turd-covered ingot. Now we, the audience, have no idea what this means. The fucking... How do you not know what this means? It means exactly what he says, that there will be consequences for Strange's actions. What will these consequences be? I don't know, but I can give an educated guess at what the implication of this statement is, you daft jelly bean. Because it's Marvel setting up a plot thread in Phase 3 that we haven't seen resolved as of Phase 4. But we have seen a hint of this issue coming back to be a problem. Remember earlier when I said I'm a nerd that still buys comic books? Please don't rewind, please don't rewind, please don't rewind, please don't rewind. Look guys, I'm a nerd that buys comic books. God damn it! See? I did say that. Well, that means I'm acutely aware of what Mordo becoming a villain actually means. You see, in the comics, Mordo was once an acolyte of Dormammu as he helps him try to invade the Earth. Hmm, seems like he had a bit of a change of heart in the movies. Just a smidge. I know what you're thinking. But Birdman, we're talking about the MCU, not the comics. You can't use the comics to explain the MCU. It's official, folks. We found someone who is more annoying than Anna. Also, can we just take a moment to appreciate Max Golden, who delivers arguably the most level-headed thing I've seen in this entire video? M my video, not his. The guy is essentially asking for there to be a middle ground between saying comic books are entirely dismissible and saying they will always carry on attributes despite only being inspired by the media in question, with his example being Drax. You decided to take such a composed and impassive statement and prime it as you arguing against Neanderthals, when in reality the dude is just asking you to meet a vibe check. You instead decided to stonewall him and completely ignored the suggestion to create the middle ground between Spider-Man can climb up walls and shoot webs, just like in the comics, and Spider-Man is capable of speed blitzing strange because this one panel has him beating up a dude super fast. But please don't look up any of Doctor Strange's speed feeds. Ooh, no, 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 that's not allowed. This is probably the gold star example of creating a straw man because the dude isn't even asking you to completely ignore the comic book comparisons. He is just outlining to you that there is a very clear difference and that you aren't really being fair by exclusively citing comics as a source. Despite scripting this video, you have already demonstrated the ability to just suck so much. Congratulations. You are an idiot. Well, let's go back to the MCU, specifically the hint I mentioned earlier. At the very end of Multiverse of Madness, Doctor Strange is visited by a strange woman who appears to cut open a portal to another dimension. Did you notice what that dimension looked like? Exactly. It's the Dark Dimension, the space that Dormammu reigns over as the Demon King. Yes, I did happen to notice the environment Strange briefly encountered in the movie, in the MCU. Not in the fucking comic book. This woman is Dormammu's niece, Clea, and in the comics, Clea and Strange battle Mordo and Dormammu for the fate of the Earth. Look, Birdman, I don't know how you haven't figured this out yet, but most sane people are not going to tell you you should completely ignore the comic book material when it comes to figuring out who the inspiration for these characters and stories are. What we are telling you is that you shouldn't look to the comics to help explain what is going on in a separate continuity, a place the events of the comic books cannot affect at least yet. This counts for literally everything from character actions to range of abilities. I mean, Stranger's Eye of Agamotto is probably the best example of a drastic change in power set. The original Eye had the ability to amplify Strange's astral projection abilities and granted him precognition. In the movies, it simply houses an Infinity Stone and essentially loses all viability and usefulness in the later films besides just being a piece of jewellery. Why would I then look at the comic book interpretation if I wanted an explanation to further aid me in understanding the Time Stone? I won't get very far. There is a very limited amount of stuff I can actually garner from the comics to aid me in understanding the movies because of how drastic the changes take to be, because this is an adaptation, not a one-to-one -one recreation. Denying this is simply that, you being in denial and trying to gatekeep what can and cannot be said with regards to these films, simply because you want to be special as the guy who reads these stupid fucking books. This is probably going to be the plot for Doctor Strange 3. So you see, Strange only delayed the 
fight for the Earth. Well, yeah, that's kind of the purpose of the sorcerers, to keep Dormammu at bay since they can't actually defeat him. It's why Strange made a bargain with him in the first place. This interdimensional creature was always going to pose a risk again. This isn't news to anyone who paid even the slightest bit of attention. And you didn't need to read a comic book to figure that out, because this isn't hard. Using the time gym, which had the ripple effect of causing Mordo to turn to evil and potentially helping Dormammu anyway. Now, the point of all this is not to state that Strange's actions against Dormammu weren't justified. I think we can all agree that it seemed reasonable on its surface. Jesus fucking Christ, saving the entire planet seemed reasonable to you. I'm so glad the act of pure desperation and final standoff against the infinite oblivion that is Strange's countless deaths seemed like a reasonable action to you. My point was to simply point out that he hadn't thought of this possibility when he used the time gem. Okay, so firstly, I don't care what glue you sniff reading those books. I'm calling it the Time Stone because that is what it is called in the films, so you can go fuck yourself. Secondly, Strange did actually account for this in his conversation with the Ancient One. He knew Mordo wasn't going to like the idea of breaking the rules in order to win, and he absolutely foresaw him leaving the Order as a possibility because of Mordo's adamant behavior against the Ancient One's actions. But, surprisingly enough, even if he didn't think about this during the three times this was mentioned to him, I don't think it's unreasonable of me to say that he did not give a shit when he was trying to prevent the world from fucking ending, you blasphemous bellend. Even after Mordo's warnings against it when he first used the time gem. So, here is the baseline for Doctor Strange's personality, as established in his first movie. Don't worry, I already covered that, so we can kind of just ignore this. He will not only blindly perform magic without properly thinking what the consequences might be, false. He will also use that magic knowing what the consequences could be if he believes the ends justify the means. If we use his canonical second appearance, Strange is not only humorously forgetful, I suppose I'll need my brother back. Oh yeah, right. I have been falling for 30 minutes! So let me get this straight. You are using the instance of Strange needing to be reminded of Loki's existence as evidence for him being consistently inconsistent. Is, is that right? The, the scene which is entirely played for comedy and has Strange putting more emphasis on Thor's umbrella over Loki in a Taika Waititi movie. This is point number three. Okay, well then, what, what is point number four? He also performs spells to help people without properly explaining to them the details of that magic. My father is alone in his house. He is not thinking. Right. This incantation requires any Asgardian modification. Once around the hair. My hair is multiple now. You have got to be taking the piss. The scene which is entirely played for comedy has Thor being tossed around like a ragdoll in a Taika Waititi movie. And I know you are going to pretend like this part wasn't important or anything since you kind of skipped over it, but Strange's priority in this moment is making sure that Thor and Loki leave the planet as promptly as possible, which is why he has no hesitation in helping Thor find Odin. The magic in question is also a mild series of teleports done for slapstick purposes and has literally zero impact on the rest of the plot going forward. If you want to put the scene on equal footing alongside a spell which could, you know, harm the very fabric of reality and an infinite number of Earths, you are smoking crystal meth. I think we now know who Strange is. Who the fuck is we, my dude? Nintendo we? Uh, we, we sports? Uh, we we monsieur? You just skipped over more than half of Strange's character development and reasoning in order to paint him as a prick. No, you're the prick. The prick who doesn't know jack shit about Strange and just tried to justify his points with fucking slapstick from a Waika Taititi movie. So let's move on to my other examples. Strange in What If? and giving the time gym to Thanos. I genuinely do not give a fuck about what if. 
I like the episode about Strange and think it's genuinely one of the better pieces of content from the MCU in Phase 4, but I don't think it matters when discussing mainline 616 Strange since the homie doesn't do any of this BS in the movies. There is also the issue of the version of Strange in this episode which directly comes into contact with Evil Strange in order to prevent him from destroying the world. You know, the paradoxical difference in motivation and character compared to the antagonist, but considering you used this as evidence for Strange being a prick, I can believe you just didn't fucking notice. Before we start, we have to nip this talking point right in the bud. You leave my ass alone. I've already said what if is canon. You can kindly turn left at the nearest exit and just leave the building. What if is canon to the MCU. As I've already explained in my other video, the head writer for what if explicitly states that what if is in fact a part of the MCU's multiverse. And as was explained in Doctor Strange 2 Electric Boogaloo, dreams are you living out your other lives in the multiverse. Oh yay, a piece of content which was retconned into the MCU because Loki forgot the multiverse already existed as a concept in Doctor the Strange One. My favorite. Mom also gave us a version of Strange which goes around killing other strangers because they are unhappy. I wonder if this very important and pivotal aspect of Strange's character, being that he is willing to just kill people if he feels like it, was discussed by Madvocate in any shape or form. Before going over the strategic genius Strange is in battle, it oh, ought to be shit. discussed why Here we go again. Oh, it, it was. Imagine if you had only just watched the entire video. Along with the fact that they refer to their multiversal selves with the pronouns I and me, all of this says that the alternate versions of the characters in What If are the same characters with all of their personality traits intact, but placed in different circumstances to see what would happen. <clears throat> Time, space, reality. It's more than a linear path. It's a prism of endless possibility where a single choice can branch out into infinite realities, creating alternate worlds from the ones you know. Infinite realities branching from one decision. One fucking decision. Do you, do you know how many decisions you have to make whenever you go and use a toaster? I don't think you quite grasp the severity of choice and how it can drastically alter your personality depending on how serious the change was. Do you think a version of yourself which is morbidly obese and a version of yourself which is Mr. Olympia are going to have the same personality traits? Because if you do, then you are fucking stupid. One of my favorite films of all time, Everything Everywhere All at Once, tackles the multiverse as a concept several leagues better than anything from modern day Marvel. At its core, we follow a woman who is canonically the absolute worst at anything she tries to do, which makes her the perfect conduit against the main antagonist because she has the most potential to learn new skills. In her travels across the multiverse, we see different realities which show her with vastly different outlooks and outcomes in life. There's one where she becomes a kung fu master after leaving her boyfriend to stay with her family, there's one where she's a chef currently losing against the Coon, and there's one where she's a lesbian with sausage fingers. In just these three examples, there are an incalculable number of decisions which she could have made that led her to these outcomes, some of which aren't even up to her, but rather evolution. Our personalities are not invariable, nor are they permanent. There are many instances where we as people can change our outlook on life. Perhaps we become happier, or maybe we get disproportionately more depressed. There is no real way of knowing where we will end up, but as someone who has been on both sides of the spectrum, I can tell you they are tremendously different. I also want you to give me the crack pipe. You don't need it anymore. That out of the way, the other two examples I gave in my Everything Wrong With video as evidence of Strange's characterization were that Strange became consumed by dark magic in his ill-advised attempt at saving Christine, and that Strange's decision to fight Ebony Ma, leading to Thanos acquiring the Time Gem, were both instances of Strange abusing magic or simply being a bonehead. If there is an example of Strange who misuses magic for the sake of being a selfish cunt, there will also be an example of one who refuses to do that in order to protect others. You know, like the one in this episode? And just like, I refuse to even acknowledge your infinity point again. I'm I'm already a few drinks in and I, I cannot be fucked. The what if situation is obvious. Strange loses himself to the dark magic he abuses to save Christine, essentially winding up a villain, destroying 99% of the universe and becoming trapped in a pocket universe. That's a slam dunk case of Strange abusing magic and not worrying about the consequences. A Smith screen. Posey will defend. Oh! 
with no regard for human life. Can you please stop using your cringy fucking reaction clips? I just, I, I, I need a hug. However, the idea that Strange giving the time gem away was a mistake seems ridiculous on its surface, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I'm glad we came to the same conclusion and that you acknowledged how stupid this argument is. Now, can I leave and never come back again? You know, because that led to Thanos losing in five years and Strange himself said, There was no other way. I don't know what it is about you, but you generate this idea of just being the youngest boomer I have ever met. Like... What? Well, my explanation is probably going to be the most interesting or hated part of this video, so strap in. Don't make another cringy reference. Don't make another cringy reference. Don't make another cringy reference. <laughs> and no, not not that kind of strap. Monster! So the prevailing thought process is that we've already seen Strange look into millions of futures and determined that there was only one way to stop Thanos, and that was the series of events we, the audience, saw in the second half of Infinity War and all of Endgame. Correct, that is what happened in the film, yes. On its surface, that would seem like I'm wrong about my position that Strange's decision was a mistake, right? On the surface, on the ceiling, under the rug, in the back of the restroom at a Wendy's, honestly, just... Name a place and you are probably wrong there too. Wrong. The first glaring issue with this is the number of future strains saw. 14,605 sounds like a huge number, but put up against infinity, it is infinitely small. Well, considering that he looked through 14 million plus realities in the span of what we can highball to be a couple of hours, it's remarkably impressive he managed to make it through so many, considering that just one of those possibilities spanned the entirety of five years plus a fair bit of time travel as well. So how many of those features did he have to view in real time before he came to one where the Avengers actually won? Strange isn't exactly working with infinite time, I think. He managed to loop time in his solo film against Dormammu, but the Dark Dimension was a place without time. Strange even says he brought the concept of time with him in order to loop Dormammu, so we could probably argue it doesn't work the same way here. And since Kaecilius can break out of the Time Stone's effects, I'm pretty sure Thanos can as well. So I doubt Strange really had many options in this fight against a wielder of four Infinity Stones, one of which can bend reality to his will. So like, sure, 14 million may seem small when paired up against Infinity, but he doesn't have an infinite amount of time in order to see as many possibilities as possible. Plus, if you want to be that guy and say Loki makes it so that these other timelines are being erased before Strange can see them, then yeah, I, I, I guess you can. I don't care either way. Because that's how many possibilities and timelines exist in the MCU. Thank you for pulling up a screenshot of a wiki article instead of grabbing a scene of the Ancient One saying the same thing. I really appreciate the amount of effort you put into saying nothing. Infinity. In an interview with Screen Crush, Michael Waldron, the writer for the TV series Loki, states that time travel basically is the multiverse and that if you zoomed in on the sacred timeline, it wouldn't look like a straight line. It might look like almost the intertwined strands of a rope. Well, this line doesn't make any sense at all, because in the context of Loki, other universes get deleted if they go against the sacred timeline. Now, I can't be bothered going into Loki's many, many, many problems and will instead refer you to Fringy's Avengers Endgame video as he does discuss Loki in more detail there. But considering that Loki fails to keep a consistent standard when discussing its own rules, I don't really see why I should be looking to its head writer for any sort of clarification regarding said rules. I'm pretty sure I'd start bleeding out of my eyes. What he's getting at there is that other timelines in the MCU act as other universes. Well, yeah, that isn't a hard concept to grasp because different decisions cause branches in time. I'm getting a severe case of deja vu here. Already know there are infinite universes in the MCU. This universe is only one of an infinite number. Thank you for playing an actual reference clip instead of citing yet another stupid wiki page. I genuinely appreciate it. Which brings us back to Strange looking into the future on Titan. It's impressive he was able to view 14 million possible realities, but 14 million is not infinity, meaning there is quite literally infinite futures in which the Avengers beat Thanos that Strange didn't see. Well, yes, that is true, but that would also mean there is an infinite number of universes where they lose. And considering that 14 million is such a small number in comparison to infinity, it means there is a very good chance Strange only saw all of the universes where they lose or never even fight in the first place. That's the issue you face when you have infinite possibilities. This tells me two things. One of. 
it tells you one of two things. One, Strange saw a possibility to win very early on in his peer into the future and kept going past it to see if there were any other chances they won. He reached 14,605 and yanked out of his trance, concluding that he only found one chance to win. Or two, Strange got all the way up to 14,604 and stopped at the 14,605th option as it was a viable win. Both of these situations produce a victory, and at the same time, both of them do not include every possibility because that would literally be impossible. I mean, yeah, that's true, technically. I just don't see what that has to do with Stranger's circumstances since he is working with limited time and can't look into the future forever until he finds a win that's just perfect. It's not a reasonable request because as we can see in this scene, normal time continues even while he keeps searching. Eventually Thanos is going to arrive and Strange needs to be in peak fighting condition in order to acquire the one win he foresaw. So all the movie was doing with that number is saying, we are giving our heroes a very small chance at winning because if taken literally Literally, this shit doesn't make any sense. True. Like, for example, maybe we aren't supposed to take statements like there are an infinite number of universes seriously because in reality, it's a large number of universes so vast that it's functionally infinite when really we just can't count a number that high. Either way, it doesn't really matter because it doesn't really serve or detract from the point of the scene, which is that the Avengers are in some deep doo-doo. Now, the following doesn't have anything to do with the thesis of this video. Good, so I can skip it then. But it's still fun and I've been wanting to share my solution to the Thanos problem for a long time. I present to you options that Strange didn't see while he was on Titan. Number one, using a portal to lop Thanos' head off while Thor has him pinned in Wakanda. Oh, that's, that's all I have. But you mean to tell me he saw the future in which Thanos explicitly told Thor he should have gone for the head, but he didn't see an option where he uses a sling ring portal to transport Thanos' head to Titan, instantly killing him and solving the problem without everyone getting dusted? No, seriously, explain to me how that's not an option without saying, this is what the writers wanted to happen. You can't say dismembering people with the portals isn't possible because Infinity War showed us that was possible. And you can't say Thanos couldn't be hurt because Stormbreaker penetrating his chest like Ezra Miller does children says, hello. Allegedly, of course. Ignoring the very, um, odd choice of joke, I'm not going to disagree with you here, Birdman. You are 100% correct in your assessment, and since Endgame confirms Doctor Strange can portal here, he should easily have been able to accomplish his goal of killing Thanos in order to save the universe. I'm pretty sure even a doctor would be willing to overlook the Earth in order to save 50% of the living population. You have highlighted a pretty commonly cited issue, and you have given a solution which could potentially solve said issue. You have done a good job. Please don't fuck it up. And before you say it, no, this is nowhere near being a similar situation to No Way Home, because in this instance, Strange has no choice but to defend people's lives, the same way he had no choice in killing the Zealot in this first film. No Way Home explicitly gives him a choice through Peter's plea, which he abandons for no good reason, something Madvocate highlights incredibly well. Clearly, that was not the only option. Maybe my option was the 14,606th, who knows? But let's get to the option Strange definitely had while still on Earth, which was my original point in the other video. No, just no, n not this again. I'm I'm not strong enough to go through this again. As we saw in Infinity War, Strange has the capability to look into the future and see possible outcomes while using the time gem. Um why didn't he use this ability when Bruce Banner crashed into the Sanctum? Because he was working with limited time and had to come up with a plan of attack after Bruce told him Thanos is coming. He needed to gain as much information as he could going forwards and as such enlisted the help of Tony Stark, one of the world's greatest defenders. After his fight with Ebony Maw, he is rendered unconscious until he's rescued by Peter and Tony. The reason why he doesn't use the stone and the ship on the way to Titan is because they don't know when they will be arriving and so he needs to be vigilant in order to secure a landing. He does use the spell on Titan because he has reached the point of no return and was looking to get as much of an advantage as possible, but points for effort. Because we didn't think of it? I'm sure you did your best. Exactly. Because if he had, he'd have seen Infinity War play out the way in which we, the audience, did. 
Oh, hello, hindsight bias. I haven't seen you in a while. Please pull up a chair. We still have a few minutes left to go. This is important because not only would he have seen destroying the time gem as a viable option considering it got destroyed anyway, and it was destroyed using a method he didn't currently have access to, and he is not a conduit to the time stone's power, so he couldn't use its own energy against it like Wanda did with Vision. Please provide me with some evidence before you make a definitive claim. He'd have seen Corvus Glaive incapacitate one of their best options at defeating Thanos. The Vision. That's an interesting assessment you have there, Birdman. I wonder if Madvik had pointed out something similar in his video. Vision is out there somewhere with the Mind Stone, and we have to find him now. Who could find Vision then? You can, Doctor Strange. Just say, find Vision. Probably Steve Rogers. Then just say, find Steve Rogers. Oh, great. Well, how about that? Remember what Vision's Mind Gem Beam did to Thanos in What If? Fascinating. Yeah. As stupid as this scene is, you are just providing more ammunition for Madvocate's point of just summoning Vision to the Sanctum Sanctorum, since he now has an instant win button against Thanos along with the assistance of two of the most powerful Avengers until Hulk gets over his stage fright. Then he has three. By trying to downplay an issue in No Way Home, you have inadvertently created a bigger one in Infinity War. So congratulations. As much as people dislike Ultron and Vision's body defeating Thanos that easily, it's that easy, and it's precisely why the writers wrote Vision out of Infinity War screenplay. He could have defeated Thanos. I don't think the writers were saying to themselves, Vision can just laser beam Thanos to death. More that he was one of the most overpowered characters in the team, and he would have posed a significant threat to Thanos' minions. Which is why the Black Order targeted him first with a sneak attack. So in a sense, you are only really half right, since the idea Vision could do this only became apparent in What If three years later, under a completely different team of creatives. So yeah, I don't think I'm going to buy that reason just yet, but you know, whatever you need to get through your video. Every single user of an Infinity Gem has given Thanos trouble from Captain Marvel to the Scarlet Witch to Ultron with the Mind Gem. And yet, Thanos with one Infinity Stone smacked the shit out of Captain Marvel. Thor with the full power of the Stormbreaker was able to dispel a completed gauntlet and yet he isn't an Infinity Stone conduit. At least until that gets retconned. Your strongest argument here would actually be Wanda since she was able to hold off five of the stones with only one hand while destroying another. Yet if you were to be consistent in your usage of Mom, then you would know the Scarlet Witch is one of the most powerful creatures in existence, which sort of makes the Infinity Stone user argument null and void, since she always had these abilities according to WandaVision. I don't even know what the Mind Stone did for her by this point. This is the problem with retconning established material, you just get fucky with the writing, but you wouldn't find this an issue, would you? So, this means instead of finding Tony Stark walking with Pepper, he should have saved WandaVision before Corvus Glaive even got there and asked for Vision to destroy the Time Gem with his beam. Boom. Exactly, Rhodey. Boom. There is nothing which suggests that one Infinity Stone can destroy another unless they share the same power in the form of the Infinity Gauntlet, which so far is the only canonical showcase of these stones being destroyed using another method that isn't a conduit. And yeah, yeah, arguing from hindsight bias, we already know that, let's just move on already. Thanos no longer has any reason to continue his quest because destroying the Time Gem means Thanos cannot complete the Infinity Gauntlet, and now with a healthy vision, he has multiple Avengers that are capable of stopping him if he still feels froggy. This option becomes unavailable to Strange once he's on Titan because Vision got incapped by that time. All because, inexplicably, he doesn't think to use an ability he is aware he has, looking to the future, and instead goes to find Tony Stark and physically fights Ebony Ma. If you have no evidence to support your claim that he didn't think of using this ability, then you are simply spouting air. There are a number of factors he needed to consider before executing this ability, and considering he was able to beef up his security before Ebony Moore arrived, it seems like he made a good call. To play devil's madvocate here, say Strange did use his spell and looked into the future for what we can assume was a few minutes before Moore showed up, considering how urgent Bruce is here, if we were to compare the amount of possible futures he saw in Titan for at most a few hours to only a few minutes on Earth, he would have had a drastically lower number of possible futures to view. And considering the almost infinite number of possibilities, he would very likely have ended up wasting his time looking for results he could have just created anyways by acting. You claim he isn't thinking in the situation when the entire scene is demonstrating the opposite. He wants to prevent the stone's capture and as such he wants to look for Vision. Who knows where Vision could be? Tony Stark. What happens when Tony doesn't know? Strange questions him until he gives him an answer to who might know. Wow, isn't it really odd how the character 
character who doesn't think things through is currently thinking ahead and asking reasonable questions. Hmm? I mean, this guy defeated Dormammu, a significantly more powerful being, by throwing him into a time loop, something he doesn't even think to use against Ebony Maw and Black Dwarf. Firstly, he did not defeat Dormammu, he simply made a bargain with him to spare the Earth, and in return, Strange would lift the loop. Secondly, the issue with the scene is that it prevents Strange introducing an element not associated with the Dark Dimension and using it against Dormammu. There is no established rule that time would work the same way in his universe. Even in What If Episode 4, Strange isn't looping the same scene over and over again. He is physically traveling back in time in order to relive the moment. Not to mention that in that very same fight, Strange attempts to use the stone almost immediately after being overpowered. You can't say he didn't attempt it. It's clearly a win button against pretty much anything that isn't the Living Tribunal. I mean, he was there when Bruce Banner said, If he gets his hands on all six stones, Tony, he could destroy life on a scale hitherto undreamt of. So why doesn't he think to use the ability he used against Dormammu? Well, he did think to use the stone right before he got captured. As for the exact ability he used against the Mamu, I've already explained that part moving on. Of course, in my Everything Wrong With video, I couldn't explain all of this then, as I only have a limited time frame for each sin because people have the attention depth of a thimble. And you couldn't explain this in your response to Madvocate because you didn't think of it. Is that the reason? But Birdman, didn't you just shit on your own audience? No. No, I would never do that. But all of this points to Strange not thinking before acting. No, it just means you can't really analyze a scene properly. Now, I'm nowhere near the genius that Strange is supposed to be, but if I could think of these solutions, he should have been able to, too. Thinking isn't really the right word I'd use here. Sharting is more like it. But this brings me back to the original point. Strange is characterized as a person that does things without thinking about them. You can only realistically come to this conclusion if you slip through half of these films. No, that is not me being hyperbolic. These films are so incredibly simple and easy to follow that it's a fucking wonder you came to this conclusion, when there is so much to point out which counters your arguments. It is a consistent feature of his throughout his appearances. Even when told exactly what he should have done, if Thanos needs all six, why don't we just stick this one down the garbage disposal? Mm, no can do. And this still may be the best chance we have against Thanos. Yeah, so conversely, it may also be his best chance against us. Hey, you might want to put that time stone in that pocket, Doc! You might want to use it. He bullheadedly does what he wants to. That's the arrogance we talked about earlier. Now, if any of you have seen Infinity War maybe more than two or three times, then your reaction to this point should be complete and utter annoyance. If Thanos needs all six, why don't we just stick this one down the garbage disposal? Mm, no can do. We swore an oath to protect the time stone with our lives. And I swore up dairy, then Ben and Jerry's flavor after me, so... Stop raving hazelnuts. Nothing. Nothing. I'm a bit chalky. I'll have the Hulk up and fudge our favorite. That's a thing. Whatever. Point is, things change. Our oath to protect the time stone cannot change. And this stone may be the best chance we have against Thanos. Yeah, so conversely, it may also be his best chance against us. Well, if we don't do our jobs. What is your job exactly besides making balloon animals? Protecting your reality, douchebag. Keep in mind, this is the same person who got annoyed that Madvik had cut out context in order to make him look bad. Birdman has just cut out over more than two minutes of screen time and several lines of dialogue from two characters, which has them stating the most important reason for why they will not destroy the Time Stone. This reason is emphasized a few more times later in the film, as well as in the sequel. Birdman is a joke. And as Yoda once told us, Lightspeed skipping! Point is, with everything we've seen of Strange leading up to his appearance in No Way Home, he's been shown as jumping into performing magic without explaining what he's doing, or thinking about the consequences, or heck, just not thinking in the first place. Well, none of that is true, and one of those points is for a tiny white titty movie, so, um... And that's all I was really saying in my video. Bloody hell, it took you a while to get that point across. Might have something to do with the fact you didn't really have that point in your original CinemaSins video, and you actively backtracked your own argument a few times in your response to Madvocate. I'd like to say the scripted video is better, but considering you made many of the same problems and issues found in your live reaction, it kind of comes off as significantly more insulting that you think you can bullshit your way past me like that simply because you put effort in. This is a very bad video. You made one good point on accident in an attempt to discredit another film's writing consistently just so you could prop up this film's trash writing and call it treasure. Now, you're more than welcome to dislike how Strange is characterized. Thank you, but I didn't need your permission, and I don't want your outlook, because it's trash. That's really an entirely different topic, and one I don't really care to discuss. Thank Christ. I'll leave that to the Maulers and JXs of the world. My job is to simply explain these films. Poorly. Your job is to explain them 
poorly. Jeremy said that himself. We've now inspired over 13,000 YouTube channels to make explainer videos on how much we suck. And that I shall, Jeremy. Now, some of you might not know this, but Birdman has uh, admitted to saying his response videos are just meant to be taken as jokes thrown CinemaSins' way, and that he doesn't actually mean a lot of what he says. It's a convenient excuse considering... I need to take him. Because he's definitely not dead. I mean, why else would Maria Hill be in this movie? Other than to take Nick Fury to a secret bunker where he can pop out and introduce us to the events of Avengers 2. Stop with the bullshit. You, of all people, definitely did not know Nick Fury wasn't dead. And there's Stark's father. Howard. Where the f*** is Roger Sterling, assholes? How are you just gonna recast younger Howard Stark and forget all about the badass you had playing the character earlier? This has got to be the stupidest shit in this whole video. You do realize that this is the second Captain America film, which means there had to have been a first, because that film was an origin story. It must have been set in the past. Hmm. Let's see who played him in the past, shall we? Carbon polymer. Should withstand your average German bayonet. Oh, snap. I guess they're using a picture of the young Howard Stark after all. Moron. It's easy to fool people when they're already fooling themselves. What does that even mean? At least in the context of this movie. Well, well, well. I would say that I'm surprised that you're purposefully misrepresenting a scene, but that's just your MO at this point. You're the head of security and your password is password? I, I don't feel good about it either. Movie has time for this. <laughs> you gotta love CinemaSins admonishing movies for doing things that they do. It's so cute. I'm so sorry for dragging you in this. Listen, you just gotta help me find these You don't have to apologize, okay? You got us a second shot at MIT. The whole reason you assholes didn't get into MIT in the first place is because you helped Peter do his Spider Man sh. Peter been moping this whole movie because he dragged MJ and Ned into his adventures. Now they get a second chance and Peter asks them to do more? And they agree? How is it even possible to contradict yourself this hard, not even two cents apart? Bam, you just made the case MIT's admissions board should recognize Peter as a hero, and now you're saying MJ and Ned shouldn't help because that would look bad to MIT? What brand of dog food are you on? I'd love to get it for my dog. The man who proclaims that he loves CinemaSins and only pokes fun at some of their mistakes seemingly takes this notion as far as it can go, seeing that he genuinely gets annoyed at CinemaSins and actively belittles him in the videos. Now, while I don't find this to be a problem considering I do this all the time, it does come off as blatantly hypocritic when he accuses Madvocate of not liking No Way Home and using any and all praise he gives the film as a shield against hate from the movie's fans. Because apparently discussing a movie for that long must mean that you just hate it, and that's the attitude I can never stand with some people. In order to like something, you have to think it's good when in reality I'm not 4 years old. I can't distinguish good from bad and like it anyways. I won't be re-watching Transformers Revenge of the Fallen because I think it's well written. I will be re-watching it because I think it's stupid and I just have fun watching it. Am I going to make a 3 hour long video saying that it's stupid and talking about its issues? No, of course not. I only reserve those kinds of videos for projects I'm genuinely passionate about. So if you want to accuse people like me and Madvocate of not liking the media we criticize simply because we make them so long, then you need to stop pretending that you like CinemaSins just because you can get some of the flack off your back. And that I shall. This has been your friendly neighborhood Birdman. And I just gave you something to talk about. You most certainly did do that, yes. And I talked about that for a really long time. So before I start growing tumors on my back and my balls, I think I'm going to end it there too. This was a terrible way for me to make my return and I despise the fact I had to sit through this. But Madvocate is a buddy and he said he'd give me a big bag of nuts if I said so. So, you know, nuts. If you enjoyed that and would like to see more content like this from me, then please consider subscribing and liking the video to let me know how you feel. I have made a few responses already covering people I thought were a bit silly, and I also make Spider-Man reviews which you can check out on my channel page. The next video we'll be uploading is likely going to be my review of The Amazing Spider-Man 1, if not, maybe something a bit shorter. If you would like to see that, then don't forget to turn on notifications so you won't miss a chance to catch it live. That's all from me today, I have a migraine the size of 15 double-decker buses, and I would very much like to go to bed. Goodbye. Ah, fuck it, dude. Let's go bowling.